later we will be hosting a series of debates. Um, we have uh, been joined by Martha Thorne, who's dean of the IE School in Madrid, and she will be hosting our um, our two debates. Uh, the way we will do it is that um, we have a team who is helping us to field questions in the text box and the chat box. So please do write down your questions as you are as we're going along. We have two sessions at five and at seven, which will be two uh, 40 minute debates. Otherwise, we'll be joining, be joined by our speakers along the day. Uh, the unfortunate uh, 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 announcement to say that Dear Cable has been chaotically intercepted in Venice, he told me. I don't completely know what it means, but I hope it's not too bad. So he has kindly sent a video that we will be showing, um, and then we'll get on to the live sessions after that. Um, but a program will start with me trying to set up a stage for our conversation. Um, and please do uh, write down your questions and maybe we can catch them in the two debate sessions. Um, otherwise, the day is pretty compressed as they always are in these kinds of events. Um, but we will definitely try to make space for um, uh, exchange and conversation. Also, please do be aware of the, uh, the UIA Congress. Um, I'll be talking about this in a minute, but this is a pre-event to the UIA Congress that we will be uh, posting um, a call for participation, call for papers here in March um, uh, 2022. And we very, very much hope that this kind of outreach will allow you to to contribute to the Congress, um, which will be in the summer of 2023. So, yeah, still, still a good time. So we'll just wait the last two minutes um, and then we'll get started. Great. So I think that we are starting now. Um, so first of all, um, I would really like to uh, welcome you all here today. I am speaking on behalf of Professor Carlo Ratti, who I see is also here right now, and myself. We've been looking very much forward to starting this important debate on how resources stored in architecture how it forms our practices and how design can shape its use. We want to think about how new awarenesses of resource can challenge the way that we build today. Today is a pre-event leading up to the UIA World Congress Sustainable Futures, which will take place here in Copenhagen in June 2023. The Congress um, asks how architecture can contribute to the achievement of the UN sustainability goals and how it can challenge the way sustainability is understood within the built environment, the way it drives how we organize and live in our societies, 
and the social, political, economic, and environmental consequences hereof. A problem statement for our joint venture here could be, as architects, we are aware of our role in shaping our societies. We understand that we are a fundamental part of the way that we form the way we live, the way we interact, and our building practices. However, when we look at the SDGs, we can see that architecture is hardly mentioned. We want to use the Congress to build awareness, both within and without of architecture, um, to discuss our impact, our ability to afford change in the way we understand and construct the world around us. We understand the SDGs as a dimension, a dimension spanning between an ecological ceiling and a, two, and, and a human uh, foundation. By continually considering these two poles, we see that every action, every agency are implementations of balance, a balance between the planetary boundaries and keeping the social foundations in focus. Across this dimension, we have defined six panels which shape the Congress discourse. These are called Design for, Design for Climate Adaptation, Rethinking Resource, Resilient Communities, Health, Inclusivity, and Partnerships for Change. Founded in the Congress Science Track, our aim is to build the knowledge base for this kind of change making across different kinds of knowledge production, scientific, practice-based, industry-informed, grassroots, and indigenous. Today's symposium starts these discourses. Carlo and I are head of the panel two, which is called Rethinking Resource. And our aim today is to ask, what is the impact on resource thinking in architecture? How can changing our material practices, the technologies and the sourcing, articulate a new awareness and how could it engender a more sustainable and more fair practice. We do this through the idea of the circular. Circular design has become a foundational axiom in sustainability design over the last decade, but it still is in its infancy in practice. But what happens when we open up circular thinking to a much broader stage? away from a singular look on resource procurement or management and into a socialized and cultured and technologized understanding of how resource is part of our societies, how it ties community to environment and how globalization of resource procurement creates very particular tensions. A starting point came from the mapping of resources in the SDGs. When we look at resource, the way it's articulated in the SDGs, the goals, the targets, and the indicators, the deep interdependencies between resource and society, environment, and ecology becomes much clearer. How does resource challenge issues of inclusivity if women have no right to land? Or how do silvicultural practices of felling trees impact on the biodiversity of our forests? What are the real socioeconomical consequences of pollution? And how can we produce with less or cleaner energy? What are the uh, real material footprints that we need to take into uh, to, to account um, when we think of globalization? So going through all of these maps has allowed us to rethink what it means to think in circular terms. It's this expansion of the circular we want to debate today. And we, to do this, we would like to uh, define some founding concepts. In the era of the Anthropocene, we're challenged to rethink our role within the Earth system if the Anthropocene started with an invention of the steam engine, as Crutzen would have it, or the detonation of the atomic bomb, or even the arrival of agriculture, it defines a starting point of a new dominance upon the Earth's ge geology and its ecosystems. And now we're meeting a point where we're becoming acutely aware that our presence, our material foundation, and the pollution that follows are fundamentally pressing 
the planetary boundaries. Over the past century, human-made mass has rapidly increased, doubling every 20 years. And we're now in a situation where there's more anthropogenic mass than there is global biomass measured in weight here. We tend to think of this in quantitative terms. We lament the engendered, engendered, endangered materials, the depletion of the sand commons. But it's not just a resource problem. As we excav excavate exponentially more, illegal mining and other processes of over-extraction are having profound impact on ecological and social context of which they're part. So fundamentally, we need to reposition our correlation to the environment in which we are part. So sustainability teaches us anything. It is that we are embedded part of the environment that surrounds us. The modernist divide between self and nature, embodied by the curtain wall, can no longer maintain an illusory idea of a passive world beyond and away. Instead, we need to entangle ourselves and partake in co-inhabiting co a world and move beyond the arrogance of thinking that the world is at our disposal. New discourse challenges this position of global exteriority. It forces us to readdress our gaze, to see the fullness of space, the density of particles in our air, the occupation of our soils, in order to visualize the consequence of our actions and potentially to correct them. Personally, I find the image of the microbiome a particularly interesting model for the thinking, thinking of entanglement. So if system thinkers of the early 20th century here, I'm thinking Murray, uh, and his contemporaries, they understood the body as a mechanism, or the information scientists here in thinking DNA understood us as, as, un, as informed by an underlying code, then today we are un, uh, entering an understanding of ourselves as co-constructed by an aggregate of microbiota that reside on or in our tissues and biofluids. We're said to be made out of 10 to 100 billion microbial cells, accounting for up to 10 times as much as human cells. This idea of an interior nature challenges the boundaries of self and environment. We are co-constructed. Nature is part of us, and we are part of nature. Sustainability was born out of an, the conservation movement. But here, the idea is one of protection. Nature is something grand and wonderful to be protected against man's technologization of energy and resource. But this perception has also driven a world in which the environment is fundamentally bounded, uh, boundaried. We have to think of our material world as one we are co-producing through practices of growing and harvesting, challenging the perception of our surroundings as inert and instead as something completely living. This binds us to a new foundation of circularity, not just the circularity of recycling, but a deeper circularity in which we're part of a continual propagation of the earth system itself. Needham says in 1959, that materials flow through biomass and it takes only a couple of thousand of years for the biomass to recycle fully. And as an architect, I find this super inspiring because it, architecture engages these timeframes Maybe not the architecture that we're building right today, which lasts maybe 80 years, but we're surrounded by buildings that can engage these deep temporalities. It makes resource thinking fundamentally metabolistic, absorbing matter to produce energy and create new matter, cycling through the Earth system at different time rates. So what is it the sustainability challenges us to ask? Well, it asks us, to rethink uh, the conceptualization in the, of an era of the Anthropocene as an increasingly acute understanding of planetary boundaries, that they challenge our traditional uh, understanding of design agency. How do we conceive a worldview which can no longer be presented as contained and beyond us, but instead in which we're always part? Or what does it mean just to be fully entangled into the world. How can we be part of and be produced by interacting multi-species socio-ecological networks? And finally, what does sustainability 
how does sustainability impact our design foundations, such as humanistic universalism and ideas of optimization, which I think are absolutely fundamental uh, keystones of architectural education and practice today. So what do we do? I think we have a series of pointers, but each of them with each their limitations. Do we optimize? The emerging paradigms of Industry 4.0 and data-supported cyber-physical systems position computational technology and augmentation as a solution space in which we can build smarter with less. Could we then build smarter with less and therefore have less materials, therefore be able to uh, engage with conservation smartly? But what happens with optimization? Jevons' paradox teaches us that optimization leads to overconsumption, as proved during the Industrial Revolution, where better coal burning led to expansion of production, not less. Or do we grow it? Biodesign and the biotech promise a new technological platform from which we can build our world, not just out of timber or other biopolymer materials, but also from synthetic systems where organisms are designed to produce the materials around us. Are we, as Bill and Clay Müller, our local biosynth uh, uh, guru here in Denmark would say, uh, entering a plant algae scene era? And what happens with this? What happens to the balances of our ecological systems? Can they readily bear this new production realm? Or will it just, will it just lead to other depletions? We know that the planetary photosynthetic ceiling is constant, meaning that the amount of photosynthesis on the planet cannot extend. If we start using this, what will happen to the ecological balances of our planet? Or just, do we just recycle it all? Can we truly untangle the way that we produce to create the infrastructures for a real recycling of the mass of materials needed? And what are the new economic models could we follow industries like Vestas to speculate on new models of ownership in which they sell the windmill but continue to own the steel so that they can reuse it at end of life? Could we imagine a developer that owned their own material? And how would this affect the incentive to, experimental, to now experimental strategies such as design for disassembly or cradle to cradle that we've been seeing prototyped over the last decades? As I said, each solution has its limitations. Today's event is to discuss these ideas, but also to form the start of a community. We hope that this you will join us for a series of the other series of the pre-events for the Congress, but also we invite you to participate by uploading your own answers to these kinds of questions through our um, scientific uh, uh, research platform. And of course, we invite you to join us through the call for participation, which will be published next spring. So without much more ado, I think we will enter the program. Fine, all right. uh, our next uh, session is called Challenging Technology. Um, and uh, Kimo Busto, who is a PhD student at Oldborg University, will now introduce uh, Carlo Ratti, uh, after which Philip Yuan will speak. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Meta. Uh, it is my delight to present the next speaker, uh, Professor Carlo Ratti. Uh, he's considered a leading figure in innovations on the relations between the city and urban living and the role and possibilities of technology. He has managed to disseminate his ideas and work to a wider common public and has become acknowledged as one of the 50 most influential designers in America. He's an architect, engineer, an educator, thinker, and designer who approaches and perceives the world as a complex web of entangled objects and phenomena full of challenges as, and more importantly, potentials. Professor Ratti is uh, on the faculty of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he directs the Sensible uh, City Lab at the Urban Technologies and Planning Program at MIT. He graduated from Polytechnic of Turin, uh, later uh, National School of Bridges and Roads in Paris, and later earned his PhD at the University of Cambridge, and has authored and co-authored uh, what feels like countless uh, papers and books, and is published in, in Nature and other prestigious and significant outlets on themes such as urban mobility and shareability networks. 
He's also a founding partner at Calorati Associates, an international architecture design and innovation office, which approaches issues of design in a multifaceted and interdisciplinary way, where he creates a productive a dialogue, to say the least, between academia and practice, designing anything from macro mobilities to buildings to design products, has, and has started multiple startups like the Super Pedestrian, uh, which was uh, initiated in Copenhagen. Uh, and I believe that he simply uh, demonstrates an important and much needed optimism given the current global issues regarding both climate change and the uh, um, Sorry, uh, and, and the pandemic with a, vers with a versatile and a resource resourceful and energ energetic way of thinking towards heightening the quality of living while, while minimizing waste. If you in the audience are uh, uh, familiar with his work, you will know that he his approach to both research and practice spans almost all scales, contains a wide and diverse set of methodological approaches regarding material and imm immaterial rich, uh, concerns digital and physical, natural and artificial. And for this reason, we are very excited to see what he will be presenting today. Uh, Professor Carlo Ratti, the floor is yours. Thank you, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for a great uh, conversation so far. Um, I wanted to share just a few slides with you. Um, let me share the screen here. All right, um, and I was adding a few of them while listening to Dirk, to the previous presentation by, by Dirk. Um, so the first thing, you know, we said it already a few times, basically just four numbers about cities, 250, 75, and 80. Cities are only 2% of the surface of the planet, but 50, actually 55% of the population, 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. So if we can do something to make our cities a little bit more sustainable, that can be a big deal globally. What, what can we do today? Uh, there's an interesting situation. The situation is the, the convergence of digital and physical. One way to, to say it is that the internet is becoming internet of things, is entering into our buildings, our cities, you know, our objects. It is changing the way we can understand, design, and ultimately live in cities. And as was mentioned before, this is part of a broader convergence, a convergence between the natural and the artificial. So we are very passionate about that, and we look at that both through the lens of research at MIT at Sensible City Lab, and also through the lens of design of practice with, uh, with our design office. So today I want to share with you just a couple of things, starting with research. So at MIT, we've been passionate about looking at waste, better understanding waste flows. And again, you know, if you want to fix some of the issues we are discussing today, including what you know, Dirk and Mette were mentioning before, um, we need to understand better what happens to, to our waste. Even in a linear economy, if you want to move to a circular one, we need to start better understand the flows. And for instance, today we know everything about the global supply chain. If you take your computer, you know everything about it, every chip in it, you know where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became that machine. However, use the computer for a few years, at one point you will throw it away and then you know very little about it. Sometimes you know, this is what happens. You know, it ends up uh, where it shouldn't. Um, and, uh, and certainly we know very little about it. So our idea was, you know, can we learn more about not the supply chain, but call it the, the removal chain. And incidentally, the removal chain, you know, the chain of waste hasn't changed that much in the past 200 years. This is a picture from over 100 years ago in New York of how waste was being sorted at the time. Um, and this is actually one of the most sophisticated uh, plants uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me well with, uh, I don't know if you can hear me well with the, with, with the sound, but basically you see it doesn't change that much. The other interesting thing is that if you look at this kind of removal chain, you know, normally we don't see it, but when something goes wrong, then uh, it's very, very visible. This is actually what happened uh, probably 10 years ago in the city of Naples in Italy, uh, when actually waste wasn't being removed anymore. So somehow, you know, we usually don't see those flows, but when something goes wrong, things become very, very visible. And there's also other issues that we, 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 we started looking at, you know, related to environmental justice. 
You know, if you look at this map, this map is toxic waste and race in the United States. And you see a lot of correlation between, uh, between the two where toxic waste goes and actually where uh, disadvantaged communities uh, live. Or you look at this, which actually is quite interesting. It's a blue and red map of the United States, but it's not the blue and red map we know usually. The map, the political map, the one that we see with Republicans and Democrats is quite similar, actually. And what you see here is where you've got big cities, you got a lot of blue, and blue here means we are recycling, um, uh, while uh, uh, in uh, the countryside where land is so cheap, we throw everything into, into landfill. So you see here is an EPA. We mapped all the EPA facilities, um, environmental, environmental Protection Agency data. And, and again, you see this, you know, where you've got big cities, you see here New York and Boston and Chicago, where the big cities, you know, land is expensive, so we recycle. But if land is cheap, we just, you know, throw to, to landfill. So anyway, we wanted to elucidate and better understand some of these uh, issues. And so our idea was quite simple. What if we could actually put, develop a little tag that we put on trash and then we follow trash? So again, you know, we embed a wireless device into the trash, you see there in one, and then trash will follow its route. And then we can see what goes where, what is shipped away, what goes to, to landfill, what is incinerated and what is, uh, is recycled. It's a little bit like what happens with nuclear medicine when we you know, we put a tracer in our blood, in our bodies, and then we follow it uh, through the body to understand what works, what doesn't work. How can we do the same thing with, uh, with the flow of waste? And we had to, to engineer the tag to the left. You see the first tag we engineer is like, you know, designing a miniature cell phone. It's a tag that gets location and sends it back. <clears throat> but, you know, unlike a cell phone, a cell phone usually wants a lot of data very quickly and you need to charge your cell phone every day or every few days. Here we wanted the opposite. We wanted something that could last without charging for weeks or months. And then, you know, it doesn't need to transmit a lot of data, very little data. It has to be intelligent as well, uh, so that basically it only turns on when it's moving. You don't want to send redundant data. You don't want to use uh, uh, power unless you, you really need it. So think about designing um, a, something like a stripped out version of a cell phone to be added to, to waste. And then we started, you know, uh, testing how to add it to waste. We also had to protect it a little bit. If you put a tag that's too fragile, it would be, it will be damaged in the, in the process. And uh, we actually started in Seattle, in the United States. Uh, we had a, you know, we, we defined a partnership with uh, the mayor's office and, uh, and we had really hundreds of people coming with uh, different types of waste, things that were thrown away. We put a little, uh, a little tag on all of that. You see it here, you know, we embedded the tag into almost every piece of waste. Uh, kids came and so, you know, people came with different uh, with objects. So, so in the end, we, we ended up with 3000 objects, all of them tagged. 500 people and 3,000 of them. Anything from banana peels to uh, electronics. And then after we tagged all of it, we started following. So here you see 3,000 objects, the day of deployment in Seattle. Some of them go to landfill, you see the main landfills in the triangle, the Asian triangle next to Seattle, in the, to the south of Seattle. Such a big surprise how far stuff started to travel. And that's in crazy ways. Look at the trace that went all the way to Chicago and then back to California. It was a printer cartridge, you know, traveling for thousands of miles across the United States. Is he moving after one month or two months? We thought that the Farewell Symphony was, uh, was the right music for, for this. But what did we learn from this? Well, the first thing we learned is actually we saw what goes to the right place, what goes to the wrong place. You know, you see it here, we follow individual traces. And when you got the individual tracer, you can then uh, understand what's going on. For instance, look at this. Here you got the rechargeable batteries. Uh, some of them traveling, traveling all across the United States, almost to Florida uh, from Seattle. 
Um, but again, cartridges, two cartridges, one from Seattle went down to this place in Baja California where there's recycling, but in another one went in a crazy way, all the way to Chicago and then and then back. So, you know, a huge waste in terms of energy to move things around the, the United States. We also discover other things. You know, some of the staff went into illegal places. And, you know, this, for instance, is a facility um, that's not an EPA facility for waste. Um, it, it's a gravel extraction plant and uh, um, actually quite a few times ended up there. Um, well, you know, we don't know what went on, but we actually sent them an email and say, yeah, you know, we, we got this. And, you know, they replied saying, no, I have no idea what you're referring to, but clearly there was something strange happening here. That's not an EPA approved facility. And then you can add, look at all of this and better understand how different categories actually move across the US. What you see here is actually the distance on the y-axis and the trash category, you see that basically e-waste, special waste travels a lot. You know, you can get thousands of, of kilometers. Um, and uh, well, actually other things, you know, travel much, uh, much less. They are recycled or go to landfill close to Seattle. So somehow, you know, the first thing, you know, we can learn a lot about all these different flows and we can think how we can optimize some of this. There's another lesson that was always very interesting is that while doing this, we actually share all the data with the volunteers, the people who came with the, with the waste, with the trash, and we tagged the trash they gave us. And it was interesting because if you give this information to people, you then start feedback loops, uh, you know, and you start changes of behavior. I remember something interesting that somebody told us, uh, you know, I used to drink water in plastic bottles, throw them away, and don't think about them anymore. And now after the project, I cannot do that anymore. You know, the person I seen on the map that that uh, her plastic bottles were going to landfill. And so they said, well, from now onwards, I'm not going to use plastic bottles anymore. So somehow the idea that this information, if we share it, can actually start good and positive feedback loops and help change behavior. Um, a third thing we discovered was actually that many things ended up outside the United States. And so we couldn't track them anymore. Actually, I told you those tags are like little, uh, um, you know, cell phones, smartphones, uh, and um, we didn't have a, we had each of them on the SIM card, and we didn't have, we didn't have a global roaming plan, you know, they would be too expensive. We were only tracking this inside the United States, but a lot of stuff disappeared. And so we did a follow-up project more recently where we actually looked at global flows, focusing just on e-waste. And we discover places such as this one in Asia, where a lot of e-waste from the United States ends up. You see it here, you can go on, uh, on our website, you can see this is all just e-waste moving across the planet. So here we follow international routes. And uh, again, a lot of that going to Asia or to, to Africa, uh, sometimes legally, but sometimes, you know, less uh, legally. So again, the, so sometimes in, in, in a more uh, difficult and uh, shady way. So somehow, you know, again, this information can help us to fix some of the issues we got at the global scale. And then I want to share with you a, another thing we discovered, but you know, more for fun is that, you know, when we were doing the project, we actually had a lot of tags and some computers also reporting back location. Again, you know, all these kind of little tags that tell you where waste is going. And that, you know, was both the tags, but also some computers were programmed in order to do the same, to tell us where e-waste and where the computers were, were going. And while we were doing this, actually, some burglar came to our lab at MIT and stole a lot of stuff, but including some of the stuff that was with tags and computer to tell you where they actually end up. And this is what happened.
So, um, so that, that was, you know, the first thing I want to share with you was about this, about how we can use data to better understand flows and especially better understand what happens to waste so that with that information, hopefully we can create a more circular society. But then the other thing I want to share with you is what, how we're looking at the same issues from our design office. So the, the, the previous project uh, and projects were done at MIT in our research lab, but uh, let me share with you also a couple of things related to design, also adding to what Dirk shared before. I want to share with you two projects. One is related to the Expo, the Expo in Dubai, which opened just a um, couple of months ago. Uh, and Expo and major events have always been opportunities to innovate, you know, from the initial World Expo, the International Fair, the World's Fair, in, uh, the first one was in London, 1851. That's a beautiful crystal palace by Paxton. But many people like Kenneth Frampton see like the beginning of modern architecture. You know, to some, to, to many other expos, this was uh, uh, Osaka, 1967, a lot of experimentation with megastructure, with uh, metabolist architecture, with inflatable architecture like here. This was our project we did at, um, in Saragossa, at the World Expo in Saragossa, where we did a building all made uh, uh, out of uh, water, digital water pavilion. You know, so somehow I'm saying that all the Expo and the Olympics usually are a good opportunity to innovate and push the boundary. This was another proposal we did for uh, the Olympics in London uh, that unfortunately uh, got stuck with a change of government before the Olympics, but actually uh, was one of the finalists for, uh, uh, for the London Olympics. Uh, called the cloud, and all this was something we did the Expo in Milan. So somehow, you know, in the next week, can take more risk than in the real city. So usually, it's a good place to to innovate. And so in Dubai, in Dubai, we had the pleasure and the privilege to uh, design the Italian pavilion. We won the international competition for this, and uh, you know, this is a team we coordinated. Our office coordinated the team together with uh, Italo Rota and uh, FM. In engineering and uh, Matteo Gatto and our core. Um, and our starting point was, can we do a pavilion where most parts are recycled or reused? And what we tried to do was experiment through different things. One thing is <clears throat> the whole pavilion actually, which is uh, at the moment open in Dubai. If you go there, you, you, know, uh, you, you can see. Um, the whole pavilion, the whole space, actually we decided we wanted the space to be like a part of a transformable journey with the idea that we will actually transport everything from Italy to Dubai with ships, uh, so much more sustainable way than sending everything by air. And then the same ships then can become, have become the roof of the pavilion. Uh, and uh, at the end of the expo, they can be dismantled and keep on sailing, uh, you know, across the planet. The real ships done by uh, uh, Fincantieri and the whole exhibition space is under the ships as you see here. So basically the ships become a way to, to to tell in a very simple way to the public the idea of reuse. You get uh, something that uh, is used to get to Dubai, then it becomes the roof of the pavilion, and then it continues being living in a different way. So these are some Im images of the ships really built by Fincantieri, one of the uh, top pro global producers of, uh, uh, of naval uh, construction and um, one of the leaders, global leaders in naval construction. Uh, actually, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we couldn't do all the trips and what we planned. Uh, so the ship arrived, but we couldn't do all of this, you know, the big uh, uh, sailing from Italy to Dubai. And then the, the ships that uh, became the roof of the pavilion, as you see here, and uh, also from the top, and then they keep on uh, sailing after the, the expo. These are some of the initial images. Um, and here is uh, the, the path inside uh, under the ships uh, and uh, with all the exhibition spaces. So you see it here uh, with uh, the idea that the ships are part of what is circular, but everything else we try to do with uh, materials that are either reused or reusable, recycled or recyclable. And, and so for instance, the, the, the facade is, uh, is made of 20 million plastic bottles, which have been recycled into this, uh, this kind of ropes, nautical ropes, and uh, will be recycled again at the have already uh, pre-booked for recycling at the end of the pavilion uh, to be turned into something else. So that's the facade and you see it here mounted on the, on the pavilion. These are some of the images. I will let the images look very similar to the renderings, but some of the real images from uh, uh, under the, um, uh, the, the, the one of the ships in Dubai. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to share with you some of the other, uh, some of the other views. But the final thing I want to share is also, I added this just a moment ago after hearing uh, the presentation by Dirk, 
uh, and uh, it's about mycelium. And this is another project we did a couple of years ago. We did it in Milan Design Week. And again, at expos, at, uh, at temporary exhibition, usually, as I said before, there's a good opportunity to innovate, but also you do something for a few months or a few weeks, and then everything goes to landfill. That's what we don't like. You know, Milan Design Week or at Expo, the Olympics, and that's what happens. So uh, here we tried to do an experiment again in circularity, and we were given a beautiful place in Milan, which is the botanical garden in the center of the city. And so we started thinking, can we grow an architecture like, like a plant? And what we did actually, here is a botanical garden in the center of Milan. This was the last um, um, Milan Design Week before, the, before COVID, so two, three years ago couple of years ago. And, uh, and what we did, we grew all these kind of mycelium elements. Uh, actually, we, it was the, the largest mycelium production ever made. It was several uh, of mycelium. Uh, we, we did it, uh, you know, starting a few weeks before the installation. So the idea that, you know, basically in just a few weeks, we grow this. By the way, we also wanted to do a pure compression structure like Dirk was saying before. And so what we did was, uh, followed the same principle by Antoni Gaudi or Polanyi before him to create this kind of uh, inverted catenary that become pure compression structures. Uh, with the idea, you know, to create like a simplified architecture, but basically a way to uh, to you do all of this with mycelium. And then uh, that was, as I mentioned, grown in a few weeks before Milan Design Week, and then after Milan Design Week was composted. So we went from earth to simplified architecture back to earth in just a matter of a few weeks. Incidentally, so that's all mycelium. There's also some organic uh, um, <clears throat> ropes in order to connect uh, uh, all the arches. You know, like Louis Kahn says, you know, architecture starts when you're putting one thing connected to, to another thing. So in this case, we actually had a, uh, a Japanese bondage master who came and did all these kind of knots and uh, connecting the, the different arches. Uh, and you see here some of the some of the things in like a, uh, with the idea as an experiment the idea can we think about a future where uh, we can really grow architecture like a like a plant? And here you see some additional images. So again, all of this just a few weeks after uh, Milan Design Week then was composted and went back completely to uh, to soil. So I will stop here. Uh, I think I use uh, my 20 minutes and uh, here you now we can stay in touch with, uh, uh, with the standard online channels. But the point was uh, to share with you both from the research point of view and the practice point of view, how we can really put circularity at the core. I'm convinced that you know, this is going to be the single most important issue in architecture in the next, uh, in the next few years and decades. It is how we can get a better integration of natural and artificial. The crisis of the Anthropocene is really because of the fracture between the two. And uh, so as architects, we can help bridge and reconcile the two poles. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carlo. It's a very interesting and also a very poetic uh, practice that you show us. I love the idea of it. Japanese bondage master being part of architectural practice. You 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 know, Mate, some some of the some of the young uh, uh, you know people in the in the office you know had a life change after this project you know, after the after learning about Japanese bondage. But anyway, that was part of the fun of the, <laughs> that installation. I'm sure I'm sure we should all um, engage more there. Um, we will skip pretty quickly into uh, uh, Philip's talk and maybe then we could have a little bit of questions um, between unless someone has a very important question that must be asked right now then I think we can uh, we can uh, we can keep uh, the flow going uh, but please do uh, jot your questions I think it's very nice also to jot them runningly into the chat box. So we've become a little bit aware of what your thoughts are and become aware of what you are, who you are and what you're thinking out there. Um, I will uh, give the word to Abhishek. Uh, Abhishek is a PhD student also at Olborg uh, University here in Denmark, and he will be presenting uh, for you. 
Hello. Hi. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, Philip Ewan. Uh, professor Ewan is a, a professor and a co-chair of Built Environment and CAUP at Tongji University. With Neil Leach, uh, he has started the Digital Futures PhD program at Tongji University and more recently the Digital Futures uh, workshop lecture and talk initiative, bringing a plethora of architectural theor uh, theoretical, pedagogical and technological uh, knowledge to the world. And it has uh, immensely benefited uh, countless students, uh, early stage researchers and professionals alike. He is also uh, the principal and co-founder of um, Archi Union Architects. Uh, Archi Union works at the intersection of Chinese culture and digital construction technology. Personally, I, ha I have been followed their work since 2013 and their works on um, uh, digital fabrication and robotic fabrication and how traditional uh, uh, pro materials proportions come, come into play has always inspired us and many of my uh, peers. In the, in the same uh, line, uh, Professor Yuan has also founded uh, co-founded the uh, Fab Union Technologies where he, he and his peers had pushed the boundaries of the architectural robotics and digital fabrication, uh, both in prefab and in situ. Uh, in various ways. Um, last I had heard, like they, they were working with uh, 20 different robotic arms and various end effector and various materials to, uh, to explore the uh, realm of materials and uh, digital technologies and how that can inform traditional and regional architecture. Through his works, he has transformed the ways of traditional construction, material usage, and fused with digital and robotic fabrication. His works are not only bound into the architectural domain, he has contributed uh, towards the development of knowledge or the technology required for the creation of architecture artifacts. Uh, so from Fab, uh, from Fab Union and Archi Union, we have, got, uh, like we have been enriched with a lot of techno uh, technologies. He is also an author of uh, various, uh, pa uh, various papers and uh, more than 20 books. Uh, one of the books I really adore about this collaborative lab, lab um, which is still on my desk, and it was a, a good opportunity to uh, show it off, maybe. So without further ado, uh, Professor Yuan, uh, the floor is yours, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the kind inv uh, invitation from Meta and the introduction from um, uh, uh, Iris Jack. And I would like to share my screen and right now. Could you see my screen? Uh, sorry. Sana, let me see you. It's okay right now? I only see you, Philip. Oh, sorry. Let me share again. Maybe Virginia can help here. Can you see the screen? Uh, yes, it's all good. Okay, okay, here we go. Okay, and um, thanks for the invitation. And the topic I want to put forward to, uh, today is resource for architecture, low tech and the high tech approaches. And hopefully um, uh, uh, I can adjust my, my practice because I'm an architect and uh, doing some design works um, um, uh, in China, I think uh, will be um, very interesting as a feedback to the topic today. So um, the panel uh, today is resourceful architecture. When we're talking about the resources in the context of architecture, we usually think about the materials and the building materials or the building materials. But what material means in terms of being a kind of resource? From the perspective of new materialism, material not only involves matter and energy, but also information. 
For example, some material contains cultural significance, some has economic impacts, and some refers to environmental issues. Furthermore, what's new materialism also tells us is about the material not static, but also in the forms of dyna dynamic flow, which could constantly evolve. Uh, keep these two points um, um, uh, in mind. Uh, we can interpret materials from two perspectives in a contemporary architecture context. On the one hand, digital technology has been deeply embedded in architecture production today, establishing an in informational process from design to fabrication. On the other hand, in the context of construction, materials are deeply associated with the parts or the production chain. Uh, for example, bricks uh, as a uh, usually uh, inscribed with the cultural information in regards to architecture preservation, timber materials and the timber crafts are usually related to industrial development, thus essentially have social uh, and uh, economic uh, values. Plastic, given its production chain and undegradable uh, nature, have directly impacts in many environmental crises. Therefore, by integrating digital fabrication technology with the material crafts or the production chain in the context of material recycling, what we can achieve uh, would not only save matter or energy for the sake of physical resources, but also engaging into the social, cultural, and environmental aspects of our living world. And we have always said the industrial technology is in conflict with culture. But uh, what we want to show is the dig digital technology and culture are uh, uh, compatible. We have achieved robotic brick mansion through um, a, a project with culture oriented uh, uh, structure. So this is uh, uh, in Chicago Biennale, we took three projects, um, Fab Union, uh, Pound Society and In Bamboo to express a topic, make new history. They demonstrate the topic in, in the form of tradition culture through the, uh, the advanced technology. And Chi Shi, uh, also named Pong Society, is showing the recycled use of the waste and bricks. Because uh, in China, the uh, context, we have a lot of uh, teardown um, process in the city uh, uh, regeneration. So uh, this project showing a potential possibility how to uh, uh, to balance the tradition uh, and nostalgia and nostalgia to the future um, uh, design works. And uh, I want to quote in uh, Philip Wurzman gave some comments to the project is about which is about the, the matter and mind is integrated in the same project. So Chi uh, uh, is um, actually uh, designed for uh, a community, an uh, artist uh, community. And in this project, actually we implement robotics to give the new materiality of the waste material. So sensors on the robotics are able to scan, recognize and provide real-time feedback of the unique characteristic of each non-standard recycled brick, uh, which help us to precisely place each brick and to achieve the global geometric form. Uh, the coincidence of this kind of roughness and accuracy is what we try to express the collaboration between the human emotions and the machinery intelligence. So the uh, dilapidation of these old bricks coordinated with the stretch display of a curving wall are uh, 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 narrating the story of people and bricks, machines and constructions, design and culture which will be spread permanently in the shadow of the external wall. When the wall in the entrance are curved a little bit uh, and the generate wrinkle wall texture becomes impressive part of the uh, uh, manipulation, which presents the architectural expression as well as the status of embodied uh, current outcomes based on the tradition. Uh, at the same time, I think the new materialism is, means the performance could be embedded into the robotic fabrication process because that could integrate in the display, displacement stress wing load, makes a result a steel structure, uh, uh, et cetera. So the precise uh, positioning of the integrated equipment of robotic mansion fabrication technology and the construction elaborating to the motor and brakes by the craftsman makes the ancient uh, uh, material, this traditional material break, 
be able to meet the requirements in the new era and produce a contemporary building, uh, attract uh, artists and uh, events uh, from the city. So the interior actually uh, uh, introducing the light into the, the main exhibition wall, which showing uh, 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 an artistic space uh, in this uh, scenario. And second part, I would like to introduce the robotic carpentry, which is a very tradition Asian uh, technology from China and also spreading to Japan. And the, we, we want to, uh, to culture orientate how this kind of wood structure be uh, uh, designed and uh, fabricate. So this is a project um, uh, where um, uh, Karachi uh, 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 has been the curator for uh, Shenzhen Biennale and I was invited to present one of the pavilion in this exhibition, which is a very uh, two minutes video showing how we make research through this project. So the materiality of timber, actually, we cannot find the big chunks right now, but uh, the laminate wood, especially for the, uh, uh, the fast uh, 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 growing uh, forest uh, spreading out in the uh, south part of China. So we introduced this kind of laminate uh, timber and try to challenge if it's possible to fabricate uh, the new materiality uh, based on this kind of language uh, structure. So this is a GLT production process. So in order to create this kind of double curvature um, materiality, we um, uh, develop the special tools, uh, robotic tools, trying to sewing and milling on the details and the joints. And which produce the potential possibility for this kind of laminate small pieces of wood into the large pieces of timber and also give a potential possibility for this kind of curvature, double curvature material. This is a, a Chinese joints to put all these kinds of uh, elements together. And, uh, uh, and after this project, I think I want to introduce, address how this kind of um, global technology uh, could collaborate with local culture. So this is an in bamboo countryside community center I would like to uh, introduce. So in Bamboo is a project guided by the, the combined forces of digital design technology and architecture traditions and the cultural context. It is a practice on a rural area, uh, but we try to, uh, uh, to uh, implement the prefab industrialization in the area of uh, digital uh, humanities. So this is the model we, uh, we brought to um, uh, Venice Biennale. And right now this model was collected um, uh, uh, Hong Kong M plus and, uh, and right now was exhibited in, in Hong Kong. And uh, in this project, uh, we can see the new materiality actually could collaborate with the local culture, but at the same time, we can create uh, the, uh, by the, the, the timbers uh, and talk about technology we introduce. So this is the multi layers of building system showing our understanding uh, and control of building performance. Uh, in order to realize the slightly complicated double curvature roof system, we have applied the prefabricated steel and timber structure for the ultra precise construction process. And, and this is uh, the, the curvature timber and uh, the beams we introduced, how to customize uh, accurately of this kind of beam system of this uh, 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 spatial, uh, 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 interesting spatial uh, building. So this is the kind of diagram showing the new process, how we introduce the young designers into the rural area construction, because uh, all this kind of uh, 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 details is not uh, uh, by the papers, it's all by the, uh, the information we can send uh, from one city to the other and to introduce the, the robotics to the rural people area. So this is the in bamboo project. We can see through the bamboo and uh, the, through the bamboo forest, 
uh, and uh, and the uh, uh, and also the field uh, of agriculture field, we can see the architecture. So the uh, the building is a certain kind of um, uh, similar to the Chinese uh, culture. We introduced the, the local uh, uh, bamboo technology and uh, making the facade and also the tiles, uh, local tiles, which can uh, can uh, uh, implement uh, uh, could could be implemented to fulfill the the, the roof system, double coverture roof system, the interiors. Uh, and also from the roof, we can see all the buildings um, uh, uh, from, from the bird view. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, the, the form of the roof system uh, embracing the local uh, trees and also interior, you can see the customization process. So every pieces of the uh, construction is accurately controlled uh, by the technology. And the, the last project I want to introduce, which just be uh, finished uh, 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 last month, uh, Shanghai organized the uh, urban space art season every two years. Uh, so I designed the, 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 the center part of this exhibition. Uh, uh, the name for the project is the Matter Box, uh, uh, which is the, uh, uh, showing our attitude to the future of the, the daily life in, in downtown city. This is a video uh, showing uh, the activity, which located at the center of the uh, town center of Shanghai. And the, another side of the site is the tradition uh, facade. And we design uh, several capsule uh, buildings and implement the plastic printing, uh, recycled plastics, how to uh, construct building in very short time. So the six uh, capsules which have different programs. So this one we have uh, embracing uh, the people, introducing the people to sitting on the roof, which is um, have some curvature um, uh, to the ground, touching the ground, and seeing the other facade, Asian facade on the other side of the square. And everything I want to introduce is um, designed and fabricated in a very short time. And uh, the construction process is around only one month. And uh, we use some implement some recycled plastic, PLA uh, plastic uh, to print it, the furniture. And also the timber uh, structure was accurately uh, uh, prefabricated and customized and in a very short time. And also the very big screen introducing uh, different scenarios from the city. People can uh, uh, see the, the, the community uh, life uh, through this big screen. And this is the matter box, uh, which have an uh, interior space. Uh, people can connect with other uh, matter space. And we implement this kind of uh, uh, recycled plastic on the, on, the, on, the, on the facade and 3D printing them in a, a super uh, efficient uh, way to present this. For example, this one is for the uh, Uyghur and this one for the uh, artist to do some uh, special exhibition space. This is a small forest in the downtown and we uh, 3D printed uh, the transparent, semi-transparent space and uh, invited people uh, coming to, to share this uh, contemporary uh, uh, daily life. So the new technology actually introduced this kind of a new uh, uh, construction and, uh, uh, and also the super efficient way to uh, make use of uh, different kind of uh, recycle or reuse material or some environment friendly materials uh, to engage into the, uh, the, uh, the daily life uh, of contemporary uh, uh, Shanghai. So this is a technology we show and just very fast present this project. And this is the, uh, the, the, all the, the, the constructing details of the project interior light and roof top uh, daylight. So the facade of this one is all printed uh, just in five or six days, six days, very efficient, customized. And uh, the timber structure uh, actually uh, make the whole frame facade. 
the interior of this space is a, a very interesting matter space. People can communicate and with different people from different space. So the other small spaces, for them, this one is for artists to present uh, 24 hours, uh, 30 artists uh, living in this box, showing uh, 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 communication with uh, the, the, uh, the citizens. And the other two, uh, one of them is for the uh, uh, Uga, uh, and the other one is for the, uh, the uh, bicycle uh, riding space. So this is a process how we very efficiently prefab all these kind of boxes and move them to the side. And, uh, and all these kind of uh, uh, matter box could be uh, modulized in different ways and from different scale. Uh, uh, and we want to embed this kind of space into the old communities and update uh, the, the, the living standard or the, the content of the uh, uh, social life in Shanghai. This is scenarios uh, for people riding the bicycle uh, inside one of the box. This is another yoga uh, box. So this is a box for the artist uh, communication uh, with the uh, citizens. This is details for the three printing facade. So actually we introduced this kind of uh, uh, digital twins and uh, to customize all this kind of uh, spatial printing and uh, to design uh, this kind of semi-transparent uh, material uh, and to create uh, uh, the, the, the relationship between the trees and, uh, and, and, the, and the object we printed, and also the furniture um, um, uh, uh, was put uh, as a foundation for the, all these kind of artworks. The most important I want to introduce is the recycling plastic. Uh, we try to make a research on this plastic from a few of my PhD students. And uh, uh, we, we try to, uh, right now, doing some research and collaborate with Nike and uh, collect the hard uh, sorting mix plastic of the raw uh, uh, material from the, uh, the, the Nike uh, sneakers. And uh, to mix them and try to uh, uh, print it uh, this kind of uh, uh, recycle uh, uh, Nike ski, uh, sneakers material to some furnitures. So this is the uh, the chair we print uh, last week, and also in the future we try to persuade um, Nike to uh, to implement this material in all the shops uh, of Nike shops in China, and to introduce this kind of recycle material to the uh, future uh, furniture and also. Uh, the, the, the culture of, of Nike. Okay, that's the, the brief introduction from my view of my practice. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, this is really wonderful to see your practice and to see the new work uh, emerging also. I think we have a, a few minutes uh, before we are starting the next session. I would really enjoy uh, if someone wants to ask some questions. Um, I think uh, it's interesting if I can warm up a little bit, maybe the audience will want to, to start thinking of some good questions for you. Um, I think it's very interesting this uh, focus on material performance that you are bringing in at the start. Um, and I was just wondering if this sort of Delanda inspired uh, position, if you feel that when you're working with the localized but also recycled materials, if there is there anything that because we know the two statements pretty well, but we don't often see them together. And I was just wondering if you feel that there's something that changes to the sort of very abstract feeling of Delanda with when you're really working with the materials and they are this in, inside of this uh, circular domain. Um, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, so when we um, organize digital futures uh, over the past few years, we invite Delanda to make a, 
a lecture, uh, I think three or four years ago. And afterwards, we make a lot of discussion on the new materialism. I think uh, the information is very important to give um, the in, not only the material, but also the material process a uh, different um, uh, opportunity. Uh, because uh, the designers, I think as a designer, I'm an architect designer. I think uh, designers always try to making things uh, but uh, right now we should put forward a question uh, 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 not only why we're making things, but also how we're making things. So that is uh, the future design is not just design an object, but also it can design a process and the redefining uh, the, the performance of material. And for example, not only the materiality could define uh, the re recycled material or environment of, environmental friendly material could be implemented in different scenarios of the uh, construction process, but also uh, uh, I quite appreciate what uh, Karate mentioned about the the, uh, the waste uh, uh, tracing, tracking the, the, the waste materials, how to uh, uh, rethinking on the material process, uh, we can uh, uh, produce uh, new opportunities to how to uh, uh, design a material or the uh, construct or, 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 or to fabricate a material in the future. So I think uh, we should rethinking on uh, the process, how the designers can engage into the whole uh, uh, opportunities. So uh, and that is uh, the future, maybe not uh, construct a, a very uh, big object, but uh, I think the future designers have a great interest in to rethinking on the inf informational process of uh, to design material and design material process. So that's, uh, I try to understand uh, the Landa's um, uh, idea. Uh, he mentioned this kind of a new materiality or new materialism is about the creating process of the future, which is about uh, the informational process of how to rethink on the material, the material intelligence. Yeah. yeah. I think that's very. Oh, uh, Hello, did you want to respond? No. Um, uh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I had it. No, let's uh, let's uh, let's continue. Okay, I, I I find it very interesting what you're saying, uh, uh, Philip. Also, I think it combines really well with our next talk with uh, Sabina, who uh, was looking at material passports. So, also, what information and how information how to manage information. I think it's really interesting. What's the footprint of managing information? I just want to ask if any of you want to uh, to post a question to either Carlo or Philip at this point. Um, please do use the chat box. Um, and please, um, you know, questions are great. So please do feel involved and please do uh, write. So, um, but otherwise, I, I suggest that we will continue um, with the. Maybe, maybe just a quick ah, comment, yeah. Mette. While we're waiting for other people to uh, to, to to jump in, um, it seems to me that there's an interesting thing. You know, when sometimes when people think about sustainability or circularity, they think more about going back to an old way of doing things. But actually, here there's a, the interesting thing also that comes out of Philip's uh, uh, work is uh, how really in order to look at circularity in the future, we need to think about a, a very integrated digital process where we can actually put all the, you know, this kind of dry assembly, dry assembly of all the whole building that then can be reused, recycled in different ways at the end of life. So somehow I think, you know, the, in, an interesting point is sometimes, well, it's not always very clear, is about the fact that uh, uh, technology networks, data and so on can help us a lot in this path towards both sustainability and circularity. So that was you know, just a quick, uh, a quick thought because sometimes people think about, let's just go back to old materials, to traditional materials. But I think the, re the way we can really tackle the big issue today is, uh, is the opposite, actually moving forward to a future where everything is digitally controlled, fabricated, dry assembled, so that then you can, we can easily dismantle, reuse it and, uh, uh, and, uh, and treat it in a circular way. So just a quick thought about that. Yeah. 
Yes, if, if you don't mind, it's a pleasure to see you, Carlo and Philip. Um, and since in the future, I will be asking the questions or not asking, but I will be uh, assisting others uh, with their questions. I, I had one for both of you. I, I so appreciated both presentations um, and this idea of redefining materials, redefining waste, redefining technology craft. My question is, how do you redefine the architect? Because one thing is, uh, one thing is uh, as Philip said, defining processes, but what is your relationship to client, to society? How do you see yourselves? And it was interesting, Philip, you said, I'm a design architect. Um, is that the way of the future? Um, and how do you define your role in the field of architecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question from Martha. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I communicate with Carol and uh, we try to co-writing co uh, an essay, uh, very interesting because actually we're sharing uh, some common ground in uh, how to address uh, the designer. Uh, for example, for me, uh, I, I, I'm the architect. But actually, uh, I think uh, uh, it's very interesting how to address uh, my practice in the uh, in, in the contemporary uh, practice uh, context of China. Uh, we not only design, but also uh, we design how to fabricate, and, and that's uh, very important because the intelligence um, of uh, the designers in the future is not just from the human itself. I think we need to introduce. The toolbox, uh, uh, for example, the environmental performance analysis tools, how to embed this kind of analysis from computer to the, uh, the future of the designer. The, the future designers should collaborate with the different tools and try to uh, introduce all these tools to the real uh, practical process. I think that's why the education uh, from different schools how we're training the future architect. It's not just a designer, but we should understand the social process and the environment process. So uh, uh, that is all this kind of procedure could be embedded into the computational uh, and the uh, uh, robotic, for example, fabrication uh, tools. So, to, uh, so the, uh, uh, how to understand the future architect is not just a human architect we define, but we, we should understand the future architect is kind of um, collaboration between the tools and uh, the human. So I think that is really important, but how to, uh, to define the, the future uh, architect roles is we still have some need to have some skills, the skills of how to understand the culture, understand the, the, uh, the, 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 the tradition and nostalgia, nostalgia. I think um, the technology, the global technology should go into the re-understanding uh, of the, the, the invisible uh, 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 or some ethical process, uh, how, why we uh, design the building and how we design the building and how to fabricate the building. So uh, my roles right now, I think we, we set up a fabricated um, 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 we name is fabric uh, uh, robotic factory, uh, which uh, uh, the architect can directly control the, the process of design. And we, we try to introduce all this kind of recycle or environmental friendly material to the constructing process. Although we are doing very small, tiny project right now, but I think, I think this kind of exper experimental practice is meaningful to give the, uh, the, the critical thinking uh, to the, the mass production right now, which is happening uh, in China, to rethinking on how to create a, a resourceful future uh, uh, into the architecture industry. So that's what I'm doing uh, uh, recently. Uh, the Thank you. Working. Thank you, Carlo. Maybe, maybe Marta will add a couple of things to what Philip was saying. Now, the first thing is actually, you know, we're doing this, uh, writing this essay as we speak, with this, this short article, and that's really because uh, when we looked at each other offices, we realized that both of us has developed like kind of a small factory 
attached to the office. So a few thousand square meters were actually with a lot of robotics and so on. I was like, well, it's interesting. You know, you, we, we did the two things without knowing that and we realized we were going in the, same, in the same direction. So we started thinking about that. And the first thing I, I like the way Philip said it is about, you know, the, the architecture, architect of tomorrow being uh, like a cyber architect, technology and human together. But to me, if you think about what we were saying before, like the only way we can recycle or reuse all the things we design is if you do this kind of dry assembly, if you start making buildings which are assembled in a similar way to how we build an airplane. We got all the components, we fabricate some of them in 3D and then we assemble them. Then if we, need, if we do this, then if we want to be relevant tomorrow as architects, we need to start designing not only the final thing, but like Philip was saying, all of the process. And to do that, you know, we need to, uh, uh, we need first of all, to be able to code and we need to have, call it like a test assembly line. You probably don't want to have the full assembly of like a giant building of a skyscraper next to your office, but like people do in industry, you want to have like a test line when you can try thing, assemble, is, is somehow the natural progression. 20 years ago, uh, we had a small fab lab in all of our offices with 3D printers and laser cutters, but there's, those were for scale models. And now we went to one-to-one, a one-to-one that can help us tomorrow to, uh, you know, this kind of test assembly line that can be uh, what then can uh, can help the designers design also the process of how we make the building. So that's what that's the first thing I wanted to mention. The second thing I wanted to mention is that um, when we look at some of this, you know, today we're talking about circularity, but more generally in sustainability, then uh, uh, we also need to to bring new, new skills into the design process. And, uh, and so going back to your question, Martha, about the architect uh, uh, tomorrow, I think that what we can do as uh, architects designers is to be what in, 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 in the last book we call choral architect, to help orchestrate many other voices, to help orchestrate many other people. Because the only way we can tackle the big difficult interdisciplinary issues we are facing today, you know, from climate change to circularity and so on, uh, is if we come all together. So I see the role of the architect as, to summarize, both design not only the final artifact, but also the process. And that process is becoming so complex that, you know, we need many more people with other skills, people from physics, from mathematics, from materials, from programming, from sociology, from social sciences, all coming together uh, in order to help that process. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I think we will continue. We will have a little um, bio break after the first debate. So um, please do uh, hold on here. <laughs> um, we will go into our second session um, where we will start with um, Sabina, um, uh, Oberhuber, uh, and I'll just introduce uh, Jens uh, Ulrich Jans, uh, who is from uh, CETA here, who will be introducing uh, Sabina. Yeah, thank you. Am I going through? Yeah, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. Uh, driven by the perspective that we are on Earth only as guests, Sabina Oberhuber believes we need to be very aware about the resources we consume and consequently how much of these resources we leave behind for the people who follow. She continues to push the development of circular economy and circular building practices forward by critically understanding the material and economic consequences of the building and, and manufacturing practices. Oberhuber holds degrees in economics from University of Münster and management from the ESCP European School of Management with a specialization in strategy and finance. Oberhuber is the co-founder of Turn2, a consulting and design company located in the Netherlands, where she, together with Thomas Rao, have developed revolutionary concepts such as light as a service, a circular framework for indoor lighting, relying on the installation and then take back of the lighting fixtures by the lighting manufacturer, and in that way, motivating reuse and eliminating waste. A lot of these thoughts was uh, from the Turn2 uh, company, was compiled into Oberhuber and Rau's uh, book from 2016, Material Matters, which has now become a, a steady uh, classic in the circular design world. Uh, this book critically explores 
for our contemporary modes of construction and material consumption and proposes new directions to avoid the current critical wasteful practices. And some of these practices was uh, especially to understand that we only have these limited materials and a lot of these materials are already bound in the, in the construction around us. And, uh, and, and through these uh, thoughts, uh, turn to develop this and spearhead the development of the material passport. And Oberhuber and I continue to work on this idea with the, of the material passport and uh, founded the Madasta Foundation and, and also Madasta the company, which is the first company to offer material passports as a service to be used by both architects, builders and, uh, and, and, and other users to get an understanding for the materials embedded in these builders, buildings and to use them optimally. Um, I thank you, Sabine. We all thank you for joining this symposium, and, and we are very looking forward to hear you uh, talk and what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind uh, kind intro introduction, Jens. So I'm really uh, honored and happy to uh, to be here, and uh, albeit not physically, but uh, to be able to share our work uh, with you at this uh, distinguished uh, uh, symposium. So uh, thank you for having me and um, I am looking also forward to discussions later. Um, I will now uh, share my screen and uh, um, uh, show you the work of the three companies uh, Jens actually uh, already mentioned. Uh, it's the work of Rao Architectures, um, a architecture company is, which is, has already been founded uh, 30 years ago with a strong focus on sustainability and uh, circularity. Um, Turn Tool, which is uh, developing circular business models and uh, um, different ways of uh, production and consumption, and uh, Madaster. And um, so I hope this, uh, this works for you. Is my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, because I cannot uh, see. Okay, so I think it is very important in the, indeed to understand why the um, economic paradigm is so important in this uh, discussion. And um, I found this quote uh, summarizes it in a very, very beautiful way. And um, it's been by Kenneth Boulding, a Canadian economist and philosopher who said, anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. And um, I think uh, that sums it all together. We why we have ended up in this uh, situation we are in at the moment, because uh, we have been looking madly through this very um, one-dimensional um, economic lens, which had uh, um, resulted in sort of ignoring all the other um, very important par parameters when we are really aware that we are guests on our planet. Because actually, I think we can only transform the system, we only can transform architecture when we really start from a different attitude towards what makes our lives possible. And I think having this metaphor of being a guest um, brings us quite far, because when you're a guest somewhere, first of all, you don't own anything. So you really have to make sure that um, what you are using will be left behind in a way you have found it. I think that is the basic rule of being a guest somewhere. And you have to be aware that there are house rules. And I think this uh, graph of uh, um, the Stockholm Resil the Resilience Institute shows very, very clearly that we have as a human species just been ignoring the house rules for many, many years. And uh, um, some of these house rules uh, translated in the economic system we have, we have already seen a different graph, but more beautifully by um, um, Dear Cable this uh, the earlier on. It's, it's about, about the linear industrial processes. It is, but it, it is also about an economic model which relies on exponential growth. And what exponential growth means, we have learned it through the uh, pandemic by now, 
But um, when it comes to resource consumptions, I always found this graph very, very staggering. What you see here is the amount of cement which has been used by the United States in the in entire 20th century. And this is the amount of cement which has been used by China in just three years from 2011 to 2013. That means that by now, this uh, amount must be much, much higher again. And this is when we're talking exponential growth. We are talking doubling times. And I uh, am, am afraid that the um, numbers uh, which Dirk earlier showed of how much longer a specific materials will last. And um, as far as I'm informed, they were not calculated based uh, taking an, into account um, economic growth and uh, exponential growth. So probably um, some of those materials will run out much earlier than projected in 2005. And this is also um, fueled again by unsustainable consumption patterns. Fortunately, uh, the turnover of construction products is not as fast, but I still that they are not, they are not made to last. And uh, if you look at what we have become accustomed to as consumers, as a human species, what is normal to uh, rates of replacement and, and replacement times, then we have to really um, step, take a step back and think if that is really um, uh, a, a sensible on, or not a mad way to treat um, what we have. And when then you again consider that in a, a cubic meter of um, mobile telephones, for example, is more gold in a, than in a cubic meter of gold ore. And that most of the materials, and there's much more, there's all the whole periodic and uh, non-gas uh, system is in such a, a mobile telephone, all the rare earth metals, and uh, they are used in, in a way that they cannot be recovered anymore. And that does not only hold true for uh, mobile telephones, but uh, as we're talking smart buildings, they also go into all those technologies we're currently, currently using. So we really have to rethink our mo modus operandi. We have to rethink the way we organize our economy. And uh, we created um, some years ago this, uh, this model where we said um, we have to think about, in fact, two cycles. One is the cycle of material production, or, uh, product, um, of production, where we have to uh, think from the beginning, from the start, that we have to be able to take materials back in the production loop. But at the same time, we also have to uh, think about the cycle of usage, where we have to make sure that we uh, use products much more long, that we use them much more intensely by maybe sharing them, but also by repairing them, them maintaining them. And if we cannot use keep them in this cycle of use any longer, then we go back to the production cycle. But also there, we can think about remanufacturing, about repurposing, and only the last lender of resort, or what I will always call the least intelligent loop of a circular economy is recycling. So um, to just show you what, what that means, because we have to rethink, really it has been said before, not only our products, but also our product processes, um, is a example we, we sh shared, uh, we developed together with Philips. It has been mentioned before. We um, asked Philips, not only to uh, not to, to deliver as lighting equipment or buy lighting equipment from them, but to deliver as light instead. And that uh, was the first uh, pilot project carried out in 2010 with, uh, with Philips in our own office. And then we took it to scale at Schiphol Airport. And the nice thing is um, the um, investment times of Schiphol Airport is uh, 15 years. But so what you could get at the market um, in, in terms of lighting equipment, which would burn for 24 hours, seven days a week, would only last for six years. So in this investment cycle of 15 years of Schiphol, um, Schiphol would have needed to replace the equipment three times, which is quite a bad business case. So we asked, um, together with Schiphol, we asked Philips to provide light instead of lighting equipment, making them responsible for the performance over the whole cycle of 15 years. And what happened? 
Philips went back to the design table. They looked at the, the equipment they were uh, to deliver and they uh, found that uh, the equipment was being broke, was uh, going to break down after six years because of a little driver. However, this driver was uh, built in, in a way that you would have to dismantle the whole installation. Now that they were responsible for those 15 years, they changed the design. And this little driver is in the front under a little lid. You can exchange it very easily. It is uh, monitored by IoT and uh, Philips can guarantee uptime for those 15 years. But then the interesting thing is as Philips re uh, retained the ownership, they also realized that those lighting equipment is a sort of resource for the future. So they changed the whole, um, the whole uh, um, design of the, of the appliance which means that it's now it is easy to upgrade, it is easy to repair, but it's also easy to disassemble. It is modular, so you, they can reconfigure and, and use it elsewhere. It is very easy to man maintain, as, as I, I told you, and it's easy to recycle. So in fact, um, the, way, the, the fact that they retained the ownership made them think that um, they can, once they have, uh, uh, have to dismantle or to take uh, the appliances back, they can do something with it in the next cycle. Uh, another example uh, which has been developed over the last uh, few years is um, Mitsubishi MUs. They are selling elevators as a service. And also those elevators are constructed in a way that they can um, very easy reuse um, all the different parts of this elevator because um, Mitsubishi understood that steel might become a scarce resource. Certainly when you'd consider um, the normal um, time span an elevator is used, namely 20 years. This one is made to function for 40 years, or it can be taken back after 20 and used elsewhere. And it all comes together with, with a very attractive financial model so uh, that you drive down investment cost also at the customer side, which makes all those business models mostly when they are designed well with the right product, with the right financial model behind it, makes it a win-win business model for the client and for the company who is um, providing the service. So this is on the business model side. Then on the design side, um, this is a um, project I want to show you from Rao Architects. We believe that we have not only to think um, of uh, um, the new buildings we are creating, but we also have to uh, think of our current building stock. What do we do with them? And uh, this is a, a project which was commissioned to us and uh, the client wanted to tear everything down. But we convinced him that he actually had a material mine and that we could reuse uh, most of what was there. And we ended up with uh, uh, designing um, a, uh, a concept and ultimately the project with retaining um, 80 to 90% of, of all the materials which were there. What we did is uh, we covered the whole construction um, with a big, big steel roof construction. And for us, it was important not only to um, keep everything which was there, but also to make sure that everything which we brought in as new materials would be um, circular, meaning that we could um, dis, um, uh, not dismantle, but uh, to, um, to take it apart. and. Um, and uh, reconstructed elsewhere. And the only thing was we couldn't find a steel roof construction company who understood our question and who could help us with that. So what uh, we did is um, we looked around and asked ourselves where could we find a sector which is thinking in um, uh, steel roof construction which you can easily assemble, disassemble, transport and reassemble. And uh, we came up with these guys. So um, we approached a roller coaster company asking, could you design a roof for us? Um, and they laughed at us and say, you know, we are designing roller coasters. That's what we do. And we said, well, probably you also can design a horizontal roller coaster. And this is what they did. And if you look, this is the, the steel roof construction of uh, um, this uh, building for Aliander. And it used also 30% less steel because every kilo of steel, a roller coaster uh, um, company or um, has to uh, to uh, to transport 
costs them fuel. So a roller coaster construction has to be by definition as lightweight as possible. And uh, um, it is easy to assemble, to disassemble, to transport and to, re to reassemble. And uh, in that way, we created this building as a um, from a material mine into a material depot. Um, if you are capable of uh, designing a building completely anew, then um, you also can think of building as a material bank. And this is actually what we did for the Triodos Bank. That's a, a building which has been fi finalized in 2019. Um, as complete wooden construction. So even the core is, is from wood. What you see here is actually the elevator shaft. So what you uh, see is that um, it's been um, constructed with uh, um, standardized wooden elements. So the assembly became in fact a logistics process. It's not longer a, a traditional building process. It's a logistics process. And it was made for disassembly, and it's the uh, building is, is been held together by hundred more than hundred and sixty thousand uh, screws, and uh, the building is also energy positive. It is uh, a uh, carbon sink, so it has along over its whole life cycle uh, sequestered more carbon than um, it uh, ever was emitted to make this building, and it will not emit any uh, carbon um, CO two during during use. And uh, the whole concept was made in the way that it's also nature inclusive. So it was built in a very uh, sensitive environment. Uh, so we have uh, um, the shape of the building actually respects the flight of the bats which live in this area. And uh, this is one of the first buildings which will not be written down to zero anymore because um, we documented everything of this building in a material passport and we, we evaluated this building also financially. And at the moment we are looking at uh, um, how to uh, put the um, value of the materials on the balance sheet of the bank. And uh, um, the material uh, passport actually uh, was developed earlier, not only for this building, but for buildings we already um, uh, uh, started uh, um, finished in, in 2013, but we realized um, building material passports, um, if we will not find a way to, um, to uh, uh, standardize them and to make them uh, very easily produced, then it will not be, then we will not be able to scale them. And in order to manage materials in our economic system, we have a um, very broad application of material passports. Otherwise, we will never get the transparency and the uh, overview of where material uh, materials are. Actually, um, we cannot organize that. And um, the way we define uh, waste actually is uh, as a material without identity. So we uh, believe, strongly believe that we have to give every material an, an identity. And uh, we've been uh, seeing uh, pictures before of uh, waste not being uh, removed. This is uh, actually not uh, um, Naples, but this is uh, Lebanon, this is uh, um, Beirut. And also there, there was a big waste crisis some weeks, away, some years ago. And this uh, white uh, stream is, uh, is why it's waste piling up in the streets of Beirut. So um, what we did is um, for the material passports, we actually, we created an online platform which automatically can generate material passports. And so we called it uh, in anal analogy to the cadaster for uh, the land registry, we called it the madaster. So it's the cadaster for materials. And what it does is uh, when you upload a load a BIM um, file, it will automatically generate a material passport and will give you an overview in which layer of brand we have what type of material you can drill down in every of those um, of those uh, circles. You can go and have a look what actually is in there and even go down to uh, from which supplier where these uh, materials supplied. Um, it also gives you a financial valuation and it also gives you um, a, an overview of the circ circularity of the building. So it, it will uh, give you a, a, a circularity score. 
and um, the database is connected to a, uh, a whole uh, ecosystem of uh, public data from LCA data, um, uh, the London Metal Exchange, etc., in order to give you a very, very broad um, uh, portfolio of information about uh, your building. And this is very useful uh, for new buildings. Actually, um, we are happy we teamed up with uh, also um, um, Felix Heisel and uh, Dirk Hebel on the Umar project. So they, it was one uh, of the first back. projects. Sorry? <laughs> was one of the first projects uh, documented in Medaster, but it's also very useful for um, um, infrastructure. And uh, we also use it for um, buildings which are going to be demolished. So we had a recently a pr big project uh, in, in Rotterdam where um, for the hospital, everything was documented in Medaster first. And then um, the uh, tender documents contained the information on uh, all the building materials and uh, the um, tender to demolish the building went to the highest bidder for the materials which in fact is quite quite logical so i just want to show you install use recreate install is temporary only the consequences are permanent the sun makes finitude in nature infinitely available data makes finitude of materials in the circular economy infinitely available in a linear economy materials get wasted finitely available mining construction consumption demolishing waste depreciated buildings, materials without an identity. Finitude is final. The earth is a closed system. Once it's gone, it's gone. In a closed system, all materials are limited additions. Let's go back. The final destination becomes the starting point. Hindsight becomes forethought, right off becomes right down. Anonymity becomes identity. Worthless becomes valuable. Buildings become material depots. Real estate becomes mobile estate. CO2 production becomes CO2 reduction. Install, use, recreate. Install, use, recreate. The cadaster of materials, the medaster, documents the identity of materials, generating continuous access to materials. Your data is online, secure, and always available to you. This results in safety, safer choices, health, better design, convenience, effective internal and external communication, Value, financial and circular residual value of materials. Insight, search, analyze, steer, and manage. Reduced cost, for instance, discount on insurances, lower financing needs, value for money. Circularity, eliminates waste. Documenting existing buildings leads to material mines. Documenting new buildings leads to material depots. Valuation of materials leads to buildings as a material bank. Install, use, recreate. Material with an identity always keeps its value. Medaster. Yes, I think that uh, actually uh, what we have to organize is our economy like a library. So we have uh, uh, materials which we use for a certain time 
and then we have to bring them back into the economic system so that someone else can be a, can be used can use them and uh, therefore um, we need someone like a librarian who knows where what is and uh, when it comes back actually um, because we think in future in the future we have in order to uh, really create a circular um, economy we have to um, realize that we have at the moment something which we call value creation chain which in fact is not really a value creation chain it's a value destruction chain because at the end all materials um, are going to to waste so we what we need in addition to this value creation chain is a value sustain chain and uh, in that chain we have to make sure that everything comes back and then we have the question where actually should the ownership of material um, lie and we believe ultimately uh, the ownership of material should be at the place where it came from so we can imagine that in the future we will be lending steel we will be lending some raw materials from a place where it came from and there will be a sort of a continuous flow also of money going back to that place because what we do at this moment we mine materials and we leave a place and a community with a big hole in the ground and uh, this is in fact if you think into generational um, justice it's a very awkward system which we created but that means that we have really to design from scratch every material, every step in the chain has to be designed with this thought in mind that potentially um, the material has to come back and that the material has to be um, treated in a way that it can be used and reused over and over again. And uh, when we designed this model, we thought, okay, there has to be also some kind of a, um, uh, legal foundation for that and what we did we created the universal of declaration of material rights what we did we took the uh, human declaration the, the universal declaration of human rights and we transformed every article and the preamble into uh, materials and it turned out that it's a very beautiful analogy to what a circular economy um, should have as as principles and uh, maybe you think that's far-fetched, which um, we uh, presented this uh, one year, no, in 2018 at the 70th birthday of uh, the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights at the UN. And they were very open to the thought. And I think uh, when you look at um, the de development in this area, there are more and more non-human um, related things, just at rivers and at parts of land which are getting rights. And we truly believe that also materials should have a right to rights. And uh, um, last but not least, I think this all comes down to uh, changing our fundamental attitude towards everything which is around us and also towards um, the future generation. And uh, what I um, always inspires me is the slogan from Patek Philippe, which I sort of reuse in a <laughs> also a quite circular way, um, because uh, this uh, could be me and my, my little daughter. And uh, um, I rephrase the sentence in, you never actually own a material, you merely take care for it for the next generation. Thank you so much. If you want to know more, we uh, the book was mentioned. Uh, we, the German edition just uh, had uh, had a complete new overhaul, um, and the English book will be available early next year by Routledge. So thank you so much for having me. And uh, if you have any questions, please. Thank you so much, Sabina. What a tour de force! Very very interesting. Uh, concepts and also practice that you are showcasing here. Um, again, please do ask questions in the in the box. We're not having a lot of luck with that one, but we were also supposed to run the sessions in this double fashion. So I will move directly into Phil, and then Martha will take over for a debate. So Sabina, I'm very thankful if you can stay a bit.
And now uh, actually, a... Meadow, could, yeah. I, could I ask a question of Sabina? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, thank you so much, Sabina. It was a really fantastic presentation. Um, I, I was particularly engaged by this idea of the material as a service. And I, I, I was just wondering in terms of the kind of technologies which you use as an infrastructure to record that, does that actually intersect with things like distributed ledger technologies? Because th these would seem to be a really appropriate mode for determining both the provenance, but also recording the histories um, as, as you move forward. So I'm just wondering whether those, those technologies actually intersect or whether you're planning to intersect them. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think uh, um, there are so the, the the material as a service is, is at the moment a more intellectual concept, but it it is uh, um, made uh, it has been enabled by all those emerging technologies, also blockchain, etc., will enable us to um, yeah to track where material has come from and also where it is going and to track it throughout the economic system. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Thank you, Phil. Also, just to remind, I think maybe you were not there, but in my introduction, I also talked about Vistas who are exploring the same ideas that you buy the windmill, but that they own the steel. I think this disruption to how we are working in economically is really, really interesting. And as yes, you were talking yeah. about in Philips, now that it 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 means it it is kind of a driver of redesign. No? for to design for disassembly. So could that happen at building level? And what would it mean to the way that buildings are financed now and you know entrepreneurship? What what is actually the role of the entrepreneur and the and the and the and the, and the economic uh, background? I think it's very interesting. Yeah, Query. very, very relevant questions. <laughs> Yeah, I heard your presentation. I was really happy to hear that there is already a steel as a service. I... <laughs> um, great. I, I'll now introduce Svenja, who is a postdoc here in CETA and at the Bavort School of Textiles, and she will um, present uh, um, Phil. Yes. Um... I feel honored to introduce our next speaker, Phil Ayers, uh, who will invite us into a world of plants and fungi as part of novel biohybrid architectural systems. Phil is an architect and associate professor at CETA at the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen and continuously develops radical visions of architecture in which living organisms and computational technologies merge to form living architectural structures. He pushes forward the research not only in his field, uh, in his own field, but in combination and collaboration with high level academic and industrial partners, acting as a principal investigator for two EU funded future and emerging technology projects. One of them being Flora Robotica, Societies of Symbiotic Robot Plant Biohybrids as Social Architectural Artifacts, which ran for, uh, from 2015 to 2019. And the other one being Fungal Architectures, uh, running from 2020 to 22. With Fungal Architectures, Phil and his team are investigating the computational capacity of mycelium in an architectural context and therefore challenge how mycelium is used and thought of in relation to architecture today. His activities also deeply influence CETA's orientation towards biomaterials and the education of the next generation of architects. Phil's curious and open mind, radical thinking, as well as his driving force to create change in all the environments he finds himself in, inspires me, the people, and probably also the organisms he works with deeply. A warm welcome to Phil Ayers and his presentation on living materials for hybrid assemblies.
you are muted. So, are you so, so, yeah, so <laughs> apologies. I'm trying, trying to work on multiple screens here. So, I, I mean, just uh, thank you so much, Svenja, for such a generous introduction. And also, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share this work with you all. Um, I hope the screen um, is visible. Uh, it should be the title. Great. <clears throat> so, um, I'd, like, I'd like to begin. Um, firstly, by giving focus to the PowerPoint. So here we are. Um, I, I'd like to begin by um, sharing this video with you and to consider this as a goal-directed material accumulation paradigm. So obviously it's an industrial paradigm. The ingot that you're seeing there is a number of meters long about 30 centimeters thick. Sorry, and Phil, can I interrupt you? I think you're moving your head in and out of the microphone. So maybe if okay. you, it's best when you're a bit close to your keyboard. Right, I'll try and uh, modify the positions here. Is this, is this better? Okay, so, so um, what, what I'm showing here is, um, I, I'd like you to consider it as a, as a goal-directed material accumulation paradigm. Uh, one that's familiar to us in terms of industrial production. Uh, what you're seeing here is an ingot that has been heated at least to its third time. It's being processed by a machine, which is a 50 megawatt machine, and it's one of three on this line of production. In the space of about five minutes, it turns that ingot into a two kilometer, one millimeter thick piece of steel. It's a, a, f a phenomenal, um, cultural construct, but I'd like to compare it to this, which we can also understand as a goal-directed material accumulation paradigm. And this is one taken over the course of two months in spring, and what you're seeing is a 3D scan of a foliating bonsai. And what we can see here in terms of the material accumulation is that it's occurring in a fully distributed and a fully decentralized way. Now, when we consider uh, the situations that we're in in terms of uh, human-driven climate change, but not only that issue, also issues to do with the loss of biodiversity, um, the uh, imminent threat of mass species extinction, and also the social consequences of environmental change, then we start to have um, a series of um, mechanisms by which to understand which one of those material accumulation paradigms offers us better environmental enhancement or environmental deterioration. When we looked at the cultures of production in architecture, the idea of using bio-based materials is absolutely not new. Um, they really form the foundation of um, architectural production from Logier's primitive hut through to Philibert Delorme's understanding of using petit frais for making innovative barrel vaults, all the way through to this really exquisite timber architecture by Shiguru Ban. But what we see here is the processing of a living material and essentially turning it into dead matter, which is then processed according to architectural objectives. So the question I have, and in terms of the research that we're conducting in biohybrids, is whether we can actually leverage living complexes into the architectural systems that we're producing, not as additional layers, but as fundamental constituents to what it is that uh, the system is. This is not actually unplausible. And if we look um, across to the uh, Karzai people in Meghalaya in India, for millennia, they have been co-opting living organisms as a way of constructing intricate infrastructure in quite remote um, 
quite remote uh, locations. Some, some of these structures are hundreds of years old and they, and they sustain themselves through being continuously living. And they're molded and they have a culture of production which is shared across the generations. So here we see that there is a practice existing where living complexes really can be tuned towards the production of architectural objectives and architectural spaces. But beyond the practice, there's also scholarship that runs back over 300 years. Here we, we see the work of Friedrich Kufner, where he's exploring how it is that living trees can start to be appropriated and molded towards um, design objectives and architectural objectives. And this tradition, this arboreal tradition continues. We see here the work of Arthur Wickler, where a, perhaps a slightly more sophisticated understanding now of junction using inosculation, um, starting to think about uh, really uh, quite intricate architectural spaces and how they can exist by using and leveraging the living complex in situ um, is, is really quite a, a tantalizing prospect. And this work continues um, through the uh, really fascinating research by the Bau Botanic Group um, led by Ferdinand Ludwig, where this starts to get extended in terms of the integration of technical elements for construction, integrating these with, with the biological, turning these really into um, quite novel biohybrid systems. So we see that there, there's already um, quite a long history and a lineage um, driven largely from, from an arboreal tradition. But in terms of expanding the research horizon for biohybrid architectures, uh, we, can, we can start to think about this in terms of expanding also the um, biological targets that we might be um, employing or operating with. And in our teaching at uh, the Computation in Architecture Masters, which is affiliated with CETA, our research-led teaching environment, uh, we've had students that have really taken on board this, this kind of question, thinking not just in terms of the materiality, um, uh, but also in terms of new kinds of program and new kinds of relationships that this can engender. So here with the work of Asia Ilgum, um, she was engaging with the um, intersection of 3D print and social insects, specifically bees, as a way of constructing co-inhabited spaces. The idea that the architecture is supporting more than one species and is designed specifically for more than one species, um, keeping them separate and yet allowing them to have, to have some kind of dialogue through the architectural articulation. This also extends into um, microorganisms with the work of uh, Claudia Colmo uh, more recently. Um, again, using 3D print as a way of articulating uh, contaminated soils uh, putting them into configurations that allow the um, prolific colonization of chlorotus fungus, which is known to be a remediator of hydrocarbons. And so th this becomes a really tantalizing idea about how it is that um, an architecture can engender uh, the occupation of a, a period of construction, which is normally um, not feasible. And this is, this is the, the moment of uh, remediation of a contaminated site. So this opens up really interesting prospects um, and, and, and opens really new um, research, research horizons um, in terms of integrating living complexes with, with architecture and even suggesting new kinds of programs such as the, the restless labyrinth there. In terms of our research work, um, we've also been looking at how it is that we can start to engage with living complexes as a way of generating and weaving structures. 
So here in Flora Robotica, our interest was in how it is that um, unconventional robotics might find synergies with living plants as a way of being able to construct architectural um, artifacts. And so here, the controller that you see, uh, we have set a specific set of targets. And by controlling the um, environment through uh, directional lighting, you see we can actually get the plant to move itself within this space. And the suggestion is that this could be employed as a way of essentially weaving the plant into a given scaffold to increase um, both its structural capacity over time, but also to Im imbue it with um, living organisms that provide a platform for increasing biodiversity. Another aspect, and this opens up um, kind of new roles for the living complexes beyond the structural, uh, was really interestingly demonstrated by our partner Cybertronica within the project, where by being able to interface with the plant and read uh, bioelectric potentials, you could essentially set the plant into a form of Pavlov experiment, where the plant could become aware of its connection to a light and learn to modify its electrical biopotentials to switch the light on when it wanted light and to switch it off again when it had had enough. Moving into uh, the fungal architectures project, um, this project is, is looking at the idea of um, how it is that we can take living mycelium and um, engage with it as a construction material, but also work with it in terms of its computational uh, possibilities. The project is EU funded uh, and runs for three years, and it involves four project partners. Three of them are academic, and uh, Mogu is our industrial partner. And you see that the scope of works here is, is really related to um, each one of these expertise. Mogu looking after the fungal composites, um, our mycologist partner, University of Utrecht, looking at the fungal electronics. We have the unconventional computing lab in Bristol, dealing with the fungal computation. And then us at CETA, uh, integrating the findings of these into um, fungal architectural propositions. So, I mean, I, I don't really need to go into a description of the finer points of um, mycelium because I think Dirk and Carlo have both done that already. But uh, just to give you an indication that working with this organism um, allows us to, to really engage across both time and length scales. Uh, we see here on the top row um, a movement down through the scales into the micrometer where we actually see the organism um, exclusively, this network that breaks down the lignocellulose of its substrate. And on the bottom layer, we see uh, the mycelium um, or an inoculated substrate covered in mycelium, which has just been put into a mold. And you see that after only one week or eight days, um, the mycelium has conformed to the geometry of that mold um, in, in, in really quite conformal ways. So one of the interesting things about mycelium, and I think you know, starts to offer um, interesting new opportunities beyond conventional materials that we're more familiar with in architecture, is that uh, the mycelium grows on, on um, organic substrates. And if we map the um, available resources of residue. So essentially these are wastes that are occurring in agriculture across Europe. We see that there is a huge quantity of material that allows us to move this into possible materials that have really interesting properties as Dirk has already shown. But the question I have is, that, that, that there seem to operate two potential ways of dealing with a new material. 
One way is uh, related to the business model that our industrial partner operates with. And this is the idea of using a new material to create replacements of existing architectural elements. And I would argue that perhaps more fundamentally, what we might be asking is given a new material, what is the new architecture that we can produce from it? And I think this, this opens up uh, a, a, a much more penetrating question around the idea of the kind of architecture that we want to engender and how that can engender new kinds of ethics and new kinds of values through the application of a new material. And so this is really the remit of um, our, our project in fungal architectures. And we see that this has already started to occur in the state of the art. So in our um, fungal architecture um, paper from 2019, we did a mapping of what was then the current state of the art. And we see that people are really starting to engage in trying to develop new form languages, new kinds of identity, um, new kinds of um, structural possibility using this new material. Um, this really needs an update because there's been significant amounts of work that have occurred re um, subsequently, uh, which begin to um, also um, increase the axes of our mapping here. So not just looking at mycelium treatment or the construction logic, but also actually looking at different kinds of fabrication productions. And we've seen a lot of literature recently uh, where, we, where mycelium production is being, um, being facilitated through 3D print, for example. But uh, th this, this really kind of sets, sets the scene saying that um, you know, a new material can start to engender new kinds of architectural identity. And this is really, um, as, as I've mentioned, you know, one, of, one of the aims of the Fungal Architectures Project. So its, it's key aim is looking at how it is that we can use mycelium materials as building components, but how it is that those building components might actually engage with um, the fundamental capacities of computation uh, that are a fundamental part of living complexes. So one of the challenges that we have is of course, um, mycelium needs to grow, it grows through a substrate but of course, um, there is no binding capability in the initial phases. And so we need to have some kind of system that allows us to mold the material, hold it in its, in its um, desired geometry while that binding takes place. And this is where we've developed a construction concept that leverages um, Kagome weaving as a way of creating a, a stay in place mold that also acts subsequently as a surface reinforcement. And with the mold being made from biological material, this can really become fully integrated because the mycelium actually starts to, starts to eat into this. One of the reasons for using Kagome, um, firstly, um, as a, or, or, or actually I'll show this um, now. Firstly, um, th there are, um, really clear principles in how to um, introduce double curvature into Kagome, um, both classes of double curvature leading to elliptical geometries and also hyperbolic geometries. And the combination of these really opens up an infinite space of morphology. Uh, we can generate anything that can be described by a manifold mesh. And the real benefit of it is that um, you can construct these complex double curved morphologies from straight strips of material. Just to return to this image, one of the other things that I, I find really fascinating about Kagome is of course it has um, a, a deep history in society. And it's, um, it's a material system and method that um, can easily be learned and therefore it opens itself up to engagement by anyone. It's also a system that is largely agnostic to scale. It's largely agnostic to material and it's largely agnostic to modes of production. 
So we can be really operating at sub millimeter in terms of these topologies as, as we see in chemistry, but all the way up to um, very large scale as we see in this work that we've done with um, Bollinger and Coleman. Um, it operates working by integrating both organic materials and synthetic materials. And it also operates on an axis where we can engage with it at a pure handcraft level, but also at a highly advanced engineered level. And so this way, it, it, it really becomes a very, very accessible and open um, material system that has really real great opportunity in terms of rationalized fabrication towards complex morphology. And one of the tasks in the fungal architectures project has been about instrumentalizing um, these understandings so that we can begin to design with them. We can design with them through very lightweight descriptions, um, essentially through graphs. And also then by having instrumentalized them and being able to represent them, we can, we can generate fabrication instruction, which can um, feed both handcraft, but also um, advanced production, as we see here with robotics. And there's been a, a large amount of work looking at the development of uh, novel end effectors for actually performing this. So that, that, that kind of gives you the understanding of um, perhaps the, the um, basis of our construction methodology using these Kagomi weaves. Now moving into the material itself, um, one, one of the really interesting capacities of this material, if, if, we, if we can call it that, is the degree of material tactility that you can achieve with the same element. So on the left-hand side, you see a demolded panel, uh, which has been dried um, as Dirk was describing. So approximately 70 degrees for a couple of days. And we end up with a surface that has the quality of chipboard. On the right-hand side, we've lifted the mold and separated it so that there's a greater amount of um, air penetration whilst keeping the humidity. And there we see a ripening of the skin, which when we heat treat this ends up with a surface that feels like silk. And this idea that you know, simply by altering a protocol of production, you can move from something that has a tactility of chipboard to something that has a tactility of silk, I find really, really fascinating. Um, and this is really simply about um, altering um, a protocol of production. Here we see um, this kind of idea about the integration of the mycelium together with the Kagome stay in place mold and reinforcement. And you see how the, this is post heat treatment. So the organism has been denatured um, and we start to see that there, there becomes this very, interesting dialogue between the inoculated material and then the form itself, uh, which starts to give us really interesting novel tectonic. One of the other interesting low hanging fruits, I think in, in terms of um, mycelium composite research is that pretty much to date, um, the literature describes experiments working with essentially homogeneous substrates. And um, we've been conducting research looking at the idea of integrating orientated fibers, essentially leveraging understandings from um, the field of composite as a way of integrating meta, uh, do, do, do you mind just muting the uh, that super things? Um, so let me just run that again. So um, essentially, looking at the idea that uh, the the bulk volume of uh, the substrate might start to have orientated fibers or start to be structured in ways that start to lend new um, material properties, but also new aesthetics as well. 
Um, and this also opens up the possibility of um, essentially creating um, mycelium-based composites that can start to perform beyond simply compression, as was shown in uh, the MycoTree project. So here we have um, starting to look at um, some of these um, scaffolds. These are kind of quite early uh, placeholder studies. Um, we analyze our weaves. We can understand where the singularities need to be placed to achieve the desired morphology. Uh, in this case, we're extracting two of the example um, double curved surfaces, um, one synclastic, one anticlastic. Um, in terms of our construction methodology, then we have um, an outer um, and inner weave of rattan, which is our biological material. At present, we're using carbon fiber as our structural base. Um, we're very keen to progress beyond that and we're just initializing some experiments to move that towards um, an organic uh, material, uh, which will give us the structural property that, uh, that, that we require. And below you see us starting to um, fill this sandwich, this kind of composite of composites um, to um, start generating um, essentially a enclosed element that, that is also acting um, structurally. So, so, so that covers some of our investigations looking at um, mycelium composites in terms of their construction capability. Um, I'm now going to move into our investigations of trying to understand um, fungal organisms as computing capable. And this really um, builds upon work from Andrew Adamatsky, who's um, our partner and the, the coordinator of the project based at the Unconventional Computing Lab. And um, the Unconventional Computing Lab is, is the only um, wet lab focused on computation in the UK. And for, for many years, Andrew has been working on how, how it is that we can start to find ways of working with living complexes in computational modes. Um, one of those is to um, study uh, their response in morphology. But another interesting and perhaps um, deeper scale um, approach is to start looking at the topology of their networks. And so what you're seeing here are really um, abstract diagrams that start to show this understanding of a topology and how it is that by the control of signaling, you can start to generate Boolean logics. So this understanding um, we've started to um, apply in the context of fungal colonies. Um, and the way we're doing that is on the, on the left-hand side, you're seeing um, confocal microscopy of a fungal colony uh, done by our partners in Utrecht. This provides us with a Z stack of TIFF images, which we then need to process. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side is essentially a processed three-dimensional graph of that colony. By having a three-dimensional graph, we're then able to data mine uh, various topological conditions. So essentially the degree of the nodes that exist within that, that um, network. And from that, we can start to speculate about how it is that we can link those through shortest paths to start generating um, essentially um, circuits. This gets taken um, a little bit further in terms of um, and Andy's analysis uh, using something called SPICE analysis, which is a, a method of stimulating analog computers. Um, and here, um, the analysis is really looking at the idea of positional stimulation, uh, as well as temporal stimulation, as a way of being able to generate different kinds of logical output. 
Now, admittedly, this, this work, um, I, I would argue, is perhaps a little bit um, theoretical. Um, what we're doing here is investigating potentials um, based, based on um, theory. In, in terms of practical implementation, uh, I think we're some way off actually achieving this. Um, this is simply because the network that you're looking at there, the green bit, is sub-millimeter across. And so the idea that we can be this precise about um, firstly um, connecting to the correct hyphae uh, and stimulating them in the right patterns, uh, I think still, still is some way off. So, so the question becomes, um, you know, having laid perhaps some foundations for future research at the level of network computation, um, what is it that we can actually demonstrate as feasible and plausible now in the project? And this takes us back to um, this idea of organisms um, generating bioelectrical potentials. Um, and um, fung fungi do this both in terms of their fruiting bodies, as you're seeing here, and also in terms of their um, mycelium, the vegetative part of the organism. And the work coming out of the unconventional computing lab in collaboration with um, Mogu um, is, is really revealing some fascinating insights into how fungi respond to different stimuli in the environment, um, but also actually how they can discriminate between those different stimuli. And this starts to become very interesting in the idea of applying them as um, sensorial. Um, mats within an architectural space. So really the challenge for the project starts to become how it is that we um, integrate these findings, but not really as a way of essentially just layering them into uh, a given morphology, but um, we're, we're particularly interested in how the morphology of the architecture might even start to give character to the type of computation that is occurring. So really having an integration between an embodiment uh, that has a morphology, has a given topology at architectural scale, and that this really influences the kind of computations that are occurring. So we're starting to find um, some, some interesting relationships uh, occurring between the topology of the weave methods that we're using and how that topology can be used as essentially a communications harness between discrete parts of the living material. And what you're seeing here is, a, is another placeholder geometry, but looking at the workflows that we have in starting to, to differentiate um, our weaves, to start thinking about how it, those differentiations can lead to different material differentiations, different surface qualities, how it is that we can introduce spaces or, or features of trans, transparency as well as opacity. Um, and also how it is that um, given that artifact that we saw evolving, um, how it is that we can start to integrate this into broader workflows that start to leverage um, environmental simulation as a way of driving an understanding of situated exterior conditions and how it is that starts to drive interior properties. So if, if, um, if you happen to be in, in Copenhagen, um, with the 70% um, the less uh, CO2 exhibition is currently running uh, with uh, a, a host of exhibits uh, from, from the school. Um, and uh, our, our exhibit there is, is, is also present. So, so please come and, come and find us if, if you'd like to have a, have a tour of that. So I, I, I'd just like to kind of now finish off with um, perhaps some um, perspectives on, on how this starts to challenge some of the orthodox aspects of architectural practice. Um, and what, one of the ways in which it does this, uh, I think, you know, if, if we're thinking about integrating living complexes into architect, into fundamental parts of our architectural constructions, this really challenges 
a notion that architecture can be defined and pre-specified as, as, as a fully described inventory of parts and components. It also challenges the ways in which uh, much of orthodox practice uses computation. Um, and, and, and here really we, we see um, computation being used in a way that is a, again about providing an absolute predetermination in advance of construction to fully understand the complexity of the building and to specify. And of course, this is incredibly worthwhile and a, and a, and a, a, a very um, potent use of computation. But of course, computation allows us to engage in a time base. Um, and this really needs to be leveraged, I think, when we're starting to think about um, the design of architectures that are living and continually becoming. And it also challenges, I mean, dealing with living complexes challenges this kind of understanding um, that we have. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very long standing fiction, I think, within architectural practice that um, the moment a building has finished in construction, it is fertig or finished complete. And, and this really denies the understanding of the building essentially evolving and changing through use. Dealing with living complexes or integrating them fundamentally into our architectural constructions um, really challenges this idea of discrete phases between design, production, use, occupancy. And it starts to really entangle and, and dilute those boundaries in um, quite challenging ways. And to uh, move beyond, say, the challenges and to think about some of the kind of broader ideas that integrating living complexes engender um, and, and how this kind of starts to open up um, really interesting avenues for how architecture might develop. Um, we can look to the work of um, Suzanne Simod and uh, subsequently um, her co-researcher Biela uh, to, to understand the role that uh, specifically mycorrhizal fungi have in terms of building connections to broader ecological entanglements between different species. And starting to leverage that, saying that this becomes part of our actual architectural material, begins to suggest the idea of architectures that extend their boundaries beyond the measurable or the material. They start to engage in deeper connectivities that start to um, promote a, a broader ecological entanglement. To look to uh, a, a, a real um, um, in, important, in my view, um, project uh, that, that is, is just so intellectually stimulating for this kind of work. We've got Peter Cook and his veg house. And I, I think that, you know, what, what you're seeing here across these six vignettes, and as we move from stage one to stage six, um, we see the architect, the hand of the architect really. Um, present in stage one and almost absent in stage six. And I, I think this is a really provocative project in this idea about allowing an agency of living organisms to productively corrupt the initial um, design objectives of the architect to allow that to be essentially a scaffold or a moment that can start to become overcome um, in ways that give agency to, to these other organisms. And I, I think this, this kind of really opens up um, some interesting perspectives, perhaps also in, in relation to what um, Marta was, was questioning earlier. And I mean, my, my, my response to her question would be that I, I don't think there's any single model that there will be for an architect in the future. But I think if you're engaging in this kind of world of biohybrids and working with living complexes, um, it opens up the idea of moving away from the architect as the 
as the artist, the auteur, um, the um, ultimate um, de determiner of an environment and opening up an understanding of the architect much more as somebody who's a facilitator engendering, giving opportunity for other organisms, facilitating, even, uh, dare I use the word, shepherding over time. Uh, another idea um, really comes from... Uh, Sorry, another... Phil, I'm just going to, because um, you're 15 minutes over. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. So, I, I mean, I'll stop here. Uh, no, I, I, I don't. It's, it's so exciting. So I haven't want to stop you, but I, I keep thinking it sounds yeah. like a conclusion. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, 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 sorry, beg your pardon. Um, I mean, uh, this this is um, pretty much the last slide. So I mean, this this this, this operates from um, this kind of understanding about the the architect that has the capability of thinking beyond um, the idea of the complete building and thinking about uh, projections of the building. So John Soane in his practice was very interested in always rendering his projects as ruins, even before they were built. Um, and I, I think, you know, firstly, the ruin is a very interesting idea as kind of creating a foundation for um, new possibilities. Uh, but I think beyond the single projection to, to bring this into a kind of much more modern dialogue, uh, this kind of opens up the idea of thinking about um, complex systems, um, these kind of attractor points, where we're not thinking about trying to predict a single um, outcome, but we're actually trying to map system dynamics. And that really leads to the absolute final slide, which is how architecture starts to be thought of, not just in terms of fixed identities, but in terms of identities that can begin to meander. And Harold Fisk and his meandering maps of the Mississippi River, I think offers a very nice metaphor for this. And this, this was really taken on and given a very nice rendering in terms of Claudia's work, looking at the idea of ecological succession, the idea that over time an architecture starts to transform its identity. Um, so, so they're, they're, they're some of the ideas that I think um, dealing with living complexes um, really offer to architecture. And thank you for your attention and apologies for overrunning. Very wonderful, Phil. Thank you so much. Maybe as uh, Martha just gets ready to, to, um, to start the debate, I don't know if someone has a quick question, otherwise we'll hand straight over to Martha. I think Martha, it's wonderful if you would start. I believe that we have um, uh, Carlo and uh, Philip and Sabina and Phil with you. Um, Fantastic, fantastic. That that's uh, super meta. And once again, to all the speakers, um, thank you so much. Um, it's been really a, a wonderful opportunity for me to hear your thoughts. And I'm sure I speak for the whole audience. How inspiring and insightful the the presentations have been. We, we do have questions from the audience and they range from very specific ones. And Meta, perhaps you will ask Dirk uh, uh, Hebel at some point. Um, there's one question about final costs of his project uh, for the nest building. Um, and um, the question is, what was the cost? And if it was possible to reduce uh, the use, reduce costs through the use of recycled materials and products. And another one very specific to Dirk Hebel was about the off-gassing or degassing. De was that measured in the building? And especially as it um, has an impact on indoor climate and therefore health of the residents. So maybe you can you can send that on to him. 
I, I find it really interesting. Those were very specific questions. There are other questions that um, were directed to different people. Um, one large block, and I think anyone can answer, although this was directed um, uh, more to Sabine Oberhuber. Um, it talks about the ownership of materials. And um, if we're moving towards a state where we should question ownership of materials, is there a need to discuss sustainable practices or cultures of material usage and our relation with materials? And so this person is hinting to Mete's opening talk, pointing out how our embodied, our own embodied materiality is interwoven with that which we eat, fabricate, and inhabit. And how does this perspective affect a leasing strategy? So Sabine, could you talk a little bit about that? And then I will continue on with that line because this question is also related to our other speakers, but maybe you want to address that. The, the relationship with the ownership of materials and how do you see that? Yes, oh, thank you for that question. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's very much around um, how our, our cultural relation to materials. And um, I think that uh, is, um, I think as I already pointed out in my, uh, in my uh, um, presentation is something which, um, sort of has really to move from a purely um, uh, functional one-dimensional uh, way of, uh, of really um, being much more humble in the way we treat we treat materials. That's also what I was fascinated with. And in, in Phil's presentation is that um, this idea of uh, um, allowing um, things to evolve and have their lives and rather than um, uh, uh, thinking that uh, the fixed state of the present will remain there forever. And I think that is, uh, is, is something which is probably in, in our current culture, something which is really, really difficult to grasp this, this in, 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 in Buddhism, you will call it, call it this, this notion of impermanence is uh, something which is much more common in, in, in the culture, but it's not at all in our Western paradigm. So I think, uh, um, yes, if we want to change our systems, it really comes uh, to changing our culture. Mm. We'll, we will get back to that. Um, but related to this first question, if I could ask Carlo Ratti, um, it's somehow related. It talked about the burglary incident um, and uh, as a result of that, uh, um, um, that presentation you gave to us, do the rights to use materials also imply a responsibility in regard to their disposal? It seems to me that in Europe, we, we've had this for quite a while. Uh, when you buy a, a small appliance, then you also are somehow paying and you're also committing to returning it to a, a, a green point or the shop for responsible disposal. But I don't think it's uh, across the board. And so could you talk a little bit about that, um, the, the right to use material, to own it, um, does this imply reuse responsibility for disposal? And how do you see that more uh, complex issue? Um, and it somehow is related to what Sabine is telling us. Yeah, thanks, Marta. Um, I, uh, it seems to me that that is, you know, it depends, it's up to us to define who is responsible. Uh, I was really intrigued by the idea of a declaration of material rights. And I think you know, probably there we should define, you know, who's in charge of, uh, of the materials. And that means both when they're used in some form and also at the end of life of that uh, particular building or thing. So that, I would say, it, depend, it depends on us how to, how to structure it. But it seems to me that uh, the doing that is certainly uh, a good approach. Now, I don't know if it is going to be the producer who's in charge also of the material through the life, as we heard before, and also for recycling at the end, or if it is the people who are using it. But certainly only with that responsibility, we can make sure that at the end of life, somebody will take care of it and uh, reuse it or recycle it. 
Great, thank you. Sabine, let me jump back to you about that because also related to this use of materials, you know, the concept of material passport or material visa. Um, do you see that it would be possible um, um, to um, have this idea of material visa, visa and possibly local exchanges where you could bank your materials. I mean, you know, of course, when we talk about carbon neutral, we have carbon credits. Do you see something like this? Um, because it was really refreshing according to this uh, uh, member of the audience. They said it was so refreshing to listen to you talk about a feasible legal and, and economic model. So Sabine, could you jump in there and um, talk a little bit about the um, visas, banking of materials and, um, um, and that aspect of, uh, of um, the legal and economic model? Yeah, sure. I just would like to um, briefly come back to the question uh, before, before I answer that one, because I um, believe that uh, uh, certainly we have to look at the type of product where uh, ownership does make sense, because um, if you look at uh, um, uh, buildings, it's completely different than uh, probably part of buildings. And uh, um I think the responsibility has to be taken where it can be taken for the whole life cycle. And given the fact that uh, um, the uh, use, the potential of reuse starts at the very, very first uh, uh, pencil um, of a designer, um, we cannot, I don't think we cannot uh, leave the ownership of materials or the responsibility for the reuse with the user. Because at the point in time when it comes to him, the product is fixed, it has been designed and uh, probably not with the consideration of being um, repairable, being able to disassemble, being able to reuse in the end in, in its I don't know, either component component or material form. So um, I think this notion of responsibility is extremely important. And uh, we have uh, become accustomed to a system where we this division of responsibility is very normal. I mean, the uh, Milton Friedman in econo economics said the business of business is business, which means that mm -hmm. everything else was not the business of business, the environment, the so so social effects, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think responsibility is a core concept we had, which we have to really reframe and, uh, and, and, and take very, very seriously. Um, sorry, and then coming to your, sorry, you had a question, Martha. No, I, I will come back to responsibility uh, and I will ask one of the Phillips to jump in there, but please continue, Sabine, then we'll come back to the concept of responsibility. Yes, and I think I, I like this idea of material visa because actually that is what we also um, envisioned of having in our um, um, sort of platform that at a certain point in time, you would have visa for for materials which sort of document where they are going a little bit coming back to phil's earlier question where by uh, digital documentation we would not only um, document where a material is at this point in time but also where it has been before and how it has used so i think this is a very good analogy to to visa and then that would also um, impact the value of the material. So aging your possibilities of banking your material somewhere. And mm -hmm. uh, um, um, the other thing was also the question of how you would do, would you do it where, um, where um, digitalization is not as advanced? I think that is something also which I read in the question. Um, I think we have a, a, an enough possibility to turn also um, sort of really um, simple data into, um, into algorithms where they can be enriched very easily. In the Medaster platform, you also can uh, upload uh, photographs and, and Excel files and still the system will be able to give you a much broader picture of what, what is in there by enriching the data. Right, thank you. Phil, Phil Ayers, would you respond? Because your, your presentation was very much 
uh, in, in the context of research. And I'm wondering what you're thinking about responsibility. Uh, well, I, I, if, if I may, I, I just wanted to ask Sabine uh, another question. Sure. Uh, Go ahead. I, I, th I think this, this kind of, um, I mean, it, it sets up a, a really interesting um, set of questions about um, new economies for material. Uh, but um, is there also a way of um, trying to ensure um, fairer distribution of materials through these kind of technologies? Because we can also imagine that essentially the moment you start to monitor the provenance, the moment you start to monitor the value, essentially we're still falling into a paradigm of the rich can afford and the poor can't. Um, is, is there a way to start thinking about how this might allow for a much more equal distribution of materiality? I think, wow, that's, a, that's an essential question we have to answer here. Um, the model we have uh, as of, um, been thinking of in this material as a service value chain uh, was that at least revenue streams would go back to um, uh, well, companies or countries like Africa, where at the moment they are sort of providing the material for the whole world, but um, with very, very little benefit actually for the local com communities. And mm -hmm. uh, very little of the value generated being shared with those communities. So that is at least a, 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 a way of uh, distributing uh, the value generated a little bit more even, but it still doesn't you, uh, solve the problem you are posing uh, or the issue you're, you're raising. So I think that's, an, uh, that's an, an, another really interesting uh, field of thought research, uh, which we had de definitely would have to address. Right. Phil, there, there is a question that, that came in to you from Martin Tomka about the idea of passport and prefab seems to start from an idea of ma material conservation. How does this fit into material change, degradation, use, and the more radical ideas that you presented? Is, is there a link? Um, well, interesting. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I would say... Uh, at the moment, it's, it's very difficult to answer that because one, one of the things with these um, composites, certainly in our research, is we haven't actually understood the longevity or duration of these materials. Um, we're, we're very engaged in um, looking at their properties, um, starting to find ways in which we can um, modify those properties through design intervention. But in terms of actually understanding their longevity, and their durability, um, I think that it, it becomes a bit premature to think about passports and how those materials can carry on. Um, if, if, there's, if there's something perhaps um, about the idea of the passport, uh, the passport suggests that the materials move. Um, and, and one of the interesting things about um, the kind of craft and, and the basis of mycelium-based composites is that um, essentially these things can exist in an incredibly local vernacular um, context. So fungi exist pretty much ubiquitously across the globe. Um, active fungal spores have recently been found deep in the ice in Antarctica. Um, so, I mean, you know, they really exist everywhere. And then when we start to think about, you know, the, the fact that they can um, feed on agricultural residues, um, immediately there's a kind of connection there. And so the idea that um, essentially you can be working with a, a very tight knit um, lo logistics of material availability I think might um, preempt or, or, or negate perhaps the need for passports. Um, may, may, maybe, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say um, that the fact that also these materials can be grown so quickly um, uh, perhaps suggests that um, passports aren't really required. Um, 
Carlo, do you want to respond to that? Because your research and presentation seems to be in juxtaposition yeah. with Phil's point of view. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll, um, in my point, I want to say I, I found the passport as it was presented like a nice concept, but a little bit misleading. And it seems to me that really what we need to have is instruction on how to dismantle things. And again, what was mentioned before, if you can do this via blockchain and so on. So, I, I mean, I like the concept, but it seems to me that the important thing is, you know, you, we got this incredible resource, which is very complex, can have different materials and so on. And so we almost need like this kind of instruction manual it can be done uh, via some kind of, uh, you know, blockchain or other type of storing digital data, it will help us to reuse most of the, to reuse or recycle most of the materials that we have. So I want to say, I thought the passport concept was cute, but it's somehow also a little bit misleading. Perhaps it's really better to think about this intelligent platform which, that can help us to put everything together at the beginning and then reuse everything or recycle everything at the end. Right, thank you. Um, Philip, you Philip just, want... Uh, could you just um, ask, uh, Carlo, uh, why, what, what would you um, think it's, is, I just didn't understand what you mean by misleading, because I think what Modesto does is it actually, actually, exactly what you just proposed, um, putting all the information together of a given building, and it's also being used for all sorts of different purposes, including the carbon footprint of a building, etc. cetera. Um, and then... Yeah. The end, you decide what you want to, how you want to, to use the data. No, what I found a bit misleading was, uh, you know, that that image of the, the, the picture of the passport, because, you know, again, the passport implies, doesn't imply disassembly, implies just movement over space. In some in some cases here, you don't have movement. So th th that's why, you know, it's, it's a cute concept, but I wonder if it is a bit more like, you know, like a BIM, and you use the BIM, the building information model, a digital twin at the very beginning, to put everything together and use the same BIM at the end to reuse, recycle, and eventually to move. But I, the, mm. the reason I said a bit misleading is that the passport, again, usually is not about assembly, disassembly, it's more about movement over, uh, over space. And in this case, it seems to me it's a bit more about assembly and disassembly, sometimes with movement, sometimes without. So that, that's why I thought you know, it was, it's an interesting way to present it, but uh, maybe the metaphor is not hundred percent doesn't gel a hundred percent. Yes, I I, I, can, I can grasp what you are saying. So it's it's about the word passport, you mean? And uh, yeah, the word passport, uh, the image that you had on the slide, that it felt like you know this was more like you know like a traditional passport, while it's more like a digital platform. It's more like a digital twin, a digital platform. Absolutely. The I think the concept from the, the passport was uh, from the fact that we said. Uh, waste is a material without out identity. So waste lands somewhere, nobody knows what, what it is, where it came from, etc. And uh, a passport is sort of our documentation of a, a identity, an identity of a given person. So that was sort of the metaphor why we use it. Thank you. Is uh, Philip Juan with us still, um, Meta? Because there are a couple questions for him, and I think it's a broader question about culture. And I think Philip was the first to say we need a new culture of architecture or the culture of architecture in the future. And um, there is a question somehow related to that. Um, Phil, you, you also, um, Phil Ayers, you also said about new values in architecture. And someone from the audience has said, is the, is the designer in some way also responsible for how the user can relate to materials in our built environment? In other words, is the designer somehow responsible for those cultural aspects or that cultural shift that that you seem to be talking about, um, Philip. And, and if so, what is that cultural shift? And then to everyone, how do you implement that? I yeah, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, it's a really interesting question. Uh, goes uh, shifting this kind of computational uh, control of uh, the ubiqui ubiquitous uh, world. Uh, if we want to um, uh, control the whole world uh, if the computation can solve all kinds of questions. So that's, uh, I think I would like to put forward the cultural aspects is not, sometimes it's not uh, computerized um, uh, 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 or control process. Uh, 
uh, uh, from the design perspective. Some, sometimes it's cultural uh, or the uh, nostalgia embedded in the, uh, the, the designers or the, or the client or the user's um, uh, perspective. Sometimes it's not, um, I think it's not just about computation or the control, or maybe uh, it's difficult to tracing or tracking all by the, the carbon uh, trails. I think culture is more than something we should set up. It's, it's an integration of the past, now, and the future. And, and the aspects of that is uh, if we can put forward um, a, a possibility and the, the culture of rethinking on the, the, the materials, if that's possible to uh, integrate this kind of uh, scientific aspects of the, uh, the, the design process into um, uncertain embedded uh, 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 nostalgias in the mindscape of human being. So this kind of mindscape, um, I think uh, is kind of material intelligence, uh, but the material intelligence is not just about the scientific intelligence. Sometimes the, this kind of uh, mindscape is from the memory, is from the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, I think uh, the, the cultural aspects of uh, the environment. Uh, so the built environment is, uh, is a kind of integration of natural, human, and the cyber. I think it's the three aspects should be collaborated with each other. So I think a digital twin probably give the physical world and the cyber world a, a certain kind of a linkage, but at the same time, how to link with human mind. I think uh, the three aspects should be taken into the consideration about the, the material. What's the means of material? Material is a kind of uh, um, um, tangible or intangible uh, aspects, I think. Um, that's that's from my uh, understanding. If uh, I don't know if uh, answer the question, uh, it's a good start. And uh, Phil Phil Ayers, if you would go on, because it, it also relates to a question that just came in uh, about how does this relate to the accessibility of these cultures or systems for users, lay people, consumers, dwellers. Um, or do we have to be experts uh, as our speakers are today in order to participate and understand? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna respond to the, the kind of question about the designer and cultures, um, firstly. Um, so, I mean, the, um, there's this really wonderful um, essay by Rob, Robin Evans called Figures, Doors and Passages. And in that he describes, um, how it is that the Palladian villa plan leads to a different society compared to the plan that has the corridor. Um, and this, this I find really fascinating because it, it starts to set the frame for saying that the way in which we organize our spaces, the ways in which we organize our, our environments and our, our urban conditions really does have an influence on the kinds of cultures that play out on them. And so therefore our, our role as designers is, is absolutely fundamentally part and parcel of helping to move, shift, critique, develop cultures. And so one, one of the things that I think is really interesting about um, the idea of beginning to um, engage in living complexes um, as part of our fundamental architectural infrastructure and the importance for why we shouldn't just be thinking about them as replacements of materials that engender the same kinds of spatial configurations that we're used to, but we're starting to drive towards new kinds of expression, new kinds of spatial organization, new kinds of relationship is that we can actually then begin to engender new kinds of culture. And one of the opportunities of doing that with living complexes is to engender greater degrees of empathy, um, a kind of ethics about having to look after our living house, our living precinct, our living urbanity, um, the idea of um, having to maintain it, um, to, to nurture it, because it nurtures us, it gives us the space that we can inhabit in. So I, I think um, 
yeah, th th this is why I think it's, it's so important that we um, take a design-led approach. One of the interesting things uh, um, about the idea of agency is that it also gives us then a balance because the organism can also begin to um, have an agency. And, it, and this is why I talk about the role of the architect if we're engaging in this kind of world, being more about facilitating and enabling and shepherding rather than being the determinant artist. Great, thank you. Carlo, I'm going to give you the, the last quick word on this because I, I think, um, you know, it's very different. Uh, um, well, maybe it's not so different your approach, but clearly the impact that you have on society through presentations, through the work is, is quite an immediate one. You use technology to communicate your message. Phil has given us a very inspirational becoming stewards of our home, uh, especially in our relationship with uh, living materials. Do you, see, um, do you see a shift in the culture of the user, the lay person? And, and if so, how do we get there? Yeah, um, it, it seems to me there's something quite interesting here in what we've been discussing today is that, you know, if you look at the material and how they can be constantly uh, changed and transformed, we don't think anymore about uh, uh, like, you know, a finished building or objects, you know, so linear, the, the, the linear economy starts from something, you take the materials, you get to a certain state, and then, you know, after that, you throw things away, you, they go to landfill. But I think it seems to me that we're starting to think about like multi-states where everything keeps on being transformed into something else and being transformed with other hands. So the first thing I like very much is what Phil was saying is about, <clears throat> you know, this idea of choral architect. The architect becomes somebody who's orchestrating different things and orchestrating the process and, and allowing other people and other voices to come together. Again, choral from, uh, uh, from that point of view. But it seems to me it also brings us much closer to what, what nature does. You know, nature never has a final state. Think about the plant. You know, there's many different states, but you keep on moving from one to the other. And even when, you know, there's the end of one organism, all of that, that matter is uh, reuse, recycle into other things. And so it seems to me that, uh, that the two consequences of a lot of the things we've been saying is, uh, you know, the first one really, this one is not about this one state, the building, you know, there's materials before that, then you go to the building and then we demolish it and send it to landfill in a leaner way. But we have this kind of constant transition between different uh, uh, states. And in each of the states, we got uh, different agents. And agents can be uh, the users, agents are also all of the, uh, you know, the other living organism uh, that uh, are part of this, uh, uh, this ecosystem. And then again, you know, the role we have as architects is a bit different. It's about orchestrating the whole thing more than having full control of a certain form. Uh, it becomes a much more fluid way to think about an architecture that constantly transforms and evolves with other people and with other agents. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're we're at the end of our time for, for this dialogue. And I would just like to um, thank once again, all of our speakers. Um, it has been really um, uh, an inspiring afternoon for me and I'm sure for everyone. And um, Meta has told me that we can have 10 minutes for a break. So please go grab a coffee, a tea, a glass of water, and we will reconvene at just exactly 10 minutes after six uh, here in Europe or whatever time it is uh, where the rest of you are located. Thank you and see you in 10 minutes. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
So, uh, hi everyone. I think we can start warming up a little bit again. Um, our next session is, is much shorter. <laughs> uh, Anna and Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. We've had a very, very interesting afternoon uh, with a lot of different discussions on circularity and, and um, material ownership, material passports, material tracking, um, which has been a, a really great debate. Um, what we'll do in this session now is um, try to look at two different practices in two very different parts of the world, obviously, uh, to, to think about circularity and circular design principles in, in action, in practice. Um, and um, in this crazy format of Zoom, we're able to Zoom around the world very happily. So we have, um, we have already uh, been in dialogue with Philippe and uh, Philip in, in, uh, in Shanghai. And now we will also be talking to Jessica uh, from Comunal uh, Tele in, in Mexico. And then we will move to Sweden afterwards uh, with Anna Donnell. Um, so I will just uh, uh, introduce Rebecca. Rebecca is a PhD student at the Stuttgart uh, University, and she will introduce uh, Jessica and the uh, practice of coming out Thank you so much for being here, both of you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mette. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm here to introduce you our next speaker, Jessica Miskua. Jessica is an architect from Mexico City, uh, City, and she's here representing Comuno Taller de Arquitectura, which is a practice that she leads together with Mariana Ordonez Grajales since 2017 in Mexico. Comuno understands and conceives architecture as a collaborative, social, and constantly evolving process. Their integrative and intercultural approach dissolves the hegemonic figure of the architect as they work as mediators between the community, their needs, and their architectural object. They use architecture as a tool for social transformation and in defense of human rights. In the context of resource for architecture, and specifically the topic of the session, challenging context, the work developed by Comuno represents a framework of tools and processes that respects all life forms, thus being a great source of inspiration for our, for our inquisitive minds and critical discussions. Jessica, welcome, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thanks for the opportunity to talk about our work and our reflections. We are very happy to be, to be here. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, we will start uh, talking today about um, the different contexts uh, and the places and different cultures and geographical the spaces where we have been working on the past uh, years. Um, I will start talking about a little bit about our, uh, the geographical context of our, uh, of our work. Let me, can you see, is it okay, the screen? Can you see? It's great, we see everything very well, thank you. Okay, fair. So, uh, we will start talking about uh, this territory where, where we work. Uh, Mexico has a vast territory with a great environmental diversity integrated by 68 indigenous groups, each of them with their own ways of understanding the world, inhabiting the territory and producing architecture. Currently, the trend in our country is clear. Most Mexicans in, in, live in cities, the rural population has declined to 10% and the urbanization of rural communities is increasing at an accelerated pace. Despite this scenario, there are states of the Republic where communities represent more than 50% of the population, such as Oaxaca and Chiapas, or other states where the rural population is between 30 and 40%. It is with this rural urban phenomena and this population distribution, rurality must be understood and addressed. However, the public policies of our country are completely disconnected from the reality that exists in rural communities. 
since through their federal programs, they have imposed their own agenda based on the annulment, uh, homogenization, and industrialization of the ways of living. In our country, as in all Latin America, we are standing before a panorama of social, cultural, economic, and territorial crisis that requires to rethink our role as architects. From the approach of, of the social production and management of the habitat, we recognize all the human groups and cultures with the ability and the right to decide the course of their habitat. Therefore, we oppose the point of view of those who believe they are the only representatives to shape the world to their imaginary progress, unifying social cultural identity and standardizing the ways of living. As Enrique Ortiz asserts, we must understand humanity with the place it occupies. Our work in the communities begins with the process of research and territorial understanding from a complex vision, where we start from listening, understanding, and analyzing to open a dialogue with the villagers. In this sense, we recognize and value the ancestral constructive culture that the indigenous peoples have generated as a product of systemic understanding of the territory in which they live of their cultural richness and the life philosophy of their people. It is through the exhaustive analysis of the vernacular housing and its evolution that we can understand the recursive relationship between climate, flora, fauna, territory, dwelling, food production, traditional uses and customs, as well as the architectural and spatial relationships that make up the solar, which is a basic territorial unit in rural communities. Traditional housing in Mexico is being rapidly transformed by various factors, including the urbanization of rural areas, government programs that promote and encourage the use of industrialized materials, and public housing policies that reject and deny the importance of vernacular building systems, causing aspirational imaginaries that resignify in a negative way the concept of decent housing. The objective of our research and territorial understanding is to document and register the diverse ways of living of indigenous communities, their traditional building systems and their current modifications, as well as the intangible values and architectural wisdom from men and women that is to dissolving from one generation to another. This approach is based on a participatory active research under which knowledge is collectively built and the verticality barrier between the researcher and the community is broken. In this sense, individual authorship is rejected since it is the will find the objectives of the research and manage the course of the same. This kind of research analyzes, analyzes the logic behind the various constructive typologies we have worked with, relating formal, functional, and constructive aspects to the cultural and environmental ecosystems, always identifying a direct relationship between people, house, and site. It is from the collective, and collective understanding that we find the real beauty of vernacular housing and the great architectural legacy that indigenous communities have inherited, values that should be taken as the foundation of contemporary production. Vernacular housing is the result of meticulous observation and understanding of the system in which it is inserted, understanding the complexity of the layers that constitute its environment. It possesses a, cl a close link and a constant dialogue with the territory where the symbiosis between it and the inhabitant becomes evident not only in the form and functioning of the architectural objects, but in the way in which elements are grouped. The solar is conceived as a solar system, as a system of, of organized spaces made up of, uh, made up of built and empty components that allow the development of very, various activities related to the protection, food transformation, animal raising, production, and traditional clothing and family co coexistence. Because rural communities depend directly on natural resources for survival, they develop holistic methods for their use, which are linked to planting cycles, lunar cycles, and environmental restoration processes, achieving resilience for both ecosystems and its inhabitants. Currently, the loss of the traditional management of crops, the overexploitation of natural resources, and the presence of mega projects in rural areas have generated vulnerability in, the, in indigenous communities. In terms of community sense, the processes related to extraction of materials and the construction of the vernacular housing are viable due to the schemes of community cooperation developed by inhabitants. In spite of having different names throughout the country, such as Tequio, Faena, Manovuelta, Tarea, 
The vernacular construction involves collectivity, mutual aid, knowledge transfer, and the search for a community welfare. Through the strategy of participatory maps, we get full knowledge of the communities and the way in which they construct the understanding of their existence, the geographical location of their ethnicity, the shape of their hills, the legends that exist behind their gods, the sacred paths of pilgrimage, the places that provide water to the whole town and the harvest areas that maintain food security, as well as the recreational and living spaces. The participatory maps, when realized by age and gender, enable us to visualize the different ways in which they conceive the territory and generate new knowledge from it and the roles that these groups play, giving us an approach to the conformation of the community social structure. Understanding the labor performed by women and men, the conception that these people have of their elders' least role, the way in which children participate in public life and the manner to exercise decision making, generates a social thermometer extremely valuable to implement participatory strategies that can avoid conflicts in the community. From the social aspect, it is essential to take care of the bond between our team and, uh, and the community throughout the whole process of understanding, becoming relevant the way in which the inhabitants conceive our presence in their habitable space. In this sense, the process of validation or return of information becomes a crucial moment and the first collaborative harvest together with the community. We start from the respect and recognition of the wisdom that was shared with our team. We recognize ourselves with another system of thinking and we are aware that openness and listening are our best tools. We also know that both us and the community are responsible for safeguarding the knowledge as a whole, but we turn all the traded to have managed to capture adequately the universe that was shared with us. To understand the multiple forms under which human habitat manifests, we have resorted, resorted to the democratic vision that participatory architecture gives us. Thus, the individuals of any social group and context, cultural context, have a fundamental role in the identification of their needs and solutions for the future development of their environment. Its integrated approach respects all forms of life and leads us to conceive our architectural practice as a social process that promotes exchange of knowledge. Far beyond a romantic vision, this way of approaching architecture lead, leads to the construction of a common understanding where decision-making is carried out under various challenges for the distribution of power and through a constant tension between dissent and consensus. For this reason, we do not conceive architecture as a work of authorship or as a static, artistic, and unmodifiable object, but as a living, open, and evolving process that over time continues to adapt the, to the needs and aspirations of the people. This can be achieved because the participatory architecture is based on the knowledge generated by the community during the diverse processes to strengthen its management capacity and ensure sustainable spaces. Participation proposes another way to approach architecture where the B lectures are recognized as the center of the decision making of the project, enhancing their autonomy, self management, and empowerment. In this case, the role of the architect lies in advising, accompanying, accompanying the technical and design processes, and being part of an exchange of knowledge during all the phases of the project. As Gustavo Romero asserts, we conceive the concept of participation as a human right and as an ethical, political, and democratic stance and not as a concession from the architects. But how to understand and not to impose? Our work starts from understanding and identifying together the potential that the community has to develop the project regarding social organization, constructive skills, as well as available natural and human resources. On one hand, Carrying out the diagnostic process together with the inhabitants of the community leads to, to, the, to a way for participatory design to be adapted to the cultural, social, political, ecological, and economic context of that specific region. On the other hand, it becomes the basis from which concepts, strategies, social organization guidelines, and project criteria are constructed. The participatory design process starts from this point, and the pr primary objective is to define the qualities of the architectural project based on the community own experience in terms of their particular ways of living. The first and se second exercises of the project social production of housing located in the northeast Sierra of Puebla were developed through participatory processes with the residents of the community. 
Both projects aim to demonstrate that the quality and quant the quantitative and qualitative properties of housing can be improved when local construction knowledge and local materials are part of the time project. In spite of the collective effort that integrated research processes, knowledge sharing, technical training workshops, assemblies, and self-construction based on mutual aid, the first exercise was invalidated by the National Housing Commission, CONAVI, since its regulations considered at that time vernacular materials such as palm, bamboo, earth, and wood as precarious and inadequate. So how can many people preserve their habitat when they are forced to serve the constructive culture? Against this background, we carried out a second exercise in collaboration with the Union Indigenous Cooperatives Tosep Antitatamiski, in which we proposed a mixed constructive system with the objective of gaining, the, gaining access to federal housing subsidies and of preserving the use of bamboo in walls and roofing. The project was awarded in the first national rural housing competition organized by the government agency. However, they expressed that these winning models could not be replicated by building companies nor real estate developers, so they were considered as a failure. Again, housing was seen as a market product and not as a human right. The most significant achievement of the housing exercise was not in public policy, but in the young people of the Petsintan, who from the tra technical training workshops that took place in their community and their need to have a dignified educational space, decided to design as and self-build their own school. The concept Productive Rural School emerged from five participatory design workshops with the students who expressed the need to rethink the way of teaching and learning in rural communities by proposing an architectural program culturally appropriate to their real and needs. The project is focused on the rescue of traditional knowledge and crafts, as well as the preservation of their mother tongue Nahuatl in order to detonate local productive chains that prevent the migration and disintegration of families in the community. This conceptualization would not, be, would not have been possible from our imaginary and personal experience. Here is the relevance of dialogue and participation under equal conditions. Today, due to the collective work and community contributions, we are about to finish the second stage of the construction. Although the project has not been completed, the new school has tripled the number of students enrolled. It is serving seven communities in the region that months ago didn't have access to high school and is improving the life conditions and opportunities of young women by integrating them to local productive chains. While the Tepetzintan community was celebrating the opening of the school in 2017, a series of earthquakes devastated several communities of the states of Oaxaca, Chiapas, Morelos, and Puebla in Mexico, entities with the largest rural population in our country. Almost a month after the first earthquake occurred, the federal government, under American tile logic, made a clear call to the private construction companies to be part of the national reconstruction strategy which consisted in the delivery of financial credits for the acquisition of new homes and of pre-filled electronic cars that could not be used, or, uh, that could only be used only to, be, to buy industrialized materials. Given this scenario, the people of Santa Maria Nativitas Cuatlan, a rural community located in the Sierra Mije of Oaxaca, and with whom we carried out the project Social Construction of Habitat in collaboration with Foundation Las Haciendas del Mundo Maya, shared with us the following ideas and questions. The way we build is intelligence of our ancestors and we want to preserve that intelligence. The cards that the government gave us can only be used outside of our community. Why are we going to buy mater materials from other places when we produce just right here, materials such as adobe, wood structures, stone and lime. Our accompaniment to these people of Coatlán began with a community census to identify the magnitude of the damage caused by the earthquakes in the town. More than half of the houses built with adobe collapsed. Once the census was completed, the community expressed the needs for collaborative research from five main objectives. To identify the structural damage in the traditional houses and their causes to systematize the formula to produce the adobes in the community and the appropriate dimensions of the pieces, to identify the type of soil with the greatest resistance in the territory, 
to design an adobe production strategy for the reconstruction of more than 150 collapsed houses without generating environmental vulnerability, to develop the structural in improvement of their traditional housing through the collective thinking and exchange of knowledge. Active participatory research allowed the villagers to recognize the importance of maintaining the constructive knowledge transmitted by their ancestors and also to develop a strategy that integrated women in the production of thousands of adobe pieces that were needed for the reconstruction of their houses. In this process, we confirm that creativity is not only found in space design, since we, are not seek, we were not seeking to redesign people's lifestyles, but, a creative, but creativity was essential for the complex and collective strategy planning for social projects. A year after the earthquakes, we were, we were convened by the Ixtepecan Committee for the Defense of Life and Territory in, and the University of Earth of Oaxaca to carry out a participatory action research process about local ways of inhabiting, recovering and improving traditional housing and also to design a new housing model that could dialogue with the collective memory of the Zapotec peoples of Oaxaca. The diagnostic and participatory design sessions were held with 20 women affected by the earthquakes who expressed the most important aspects in terms of rebuilding their homes. The relations between function, action, functional spaces and the different scenarios for the pro progressive growth. This allowed us to develop a decision matrix tool that responded in a flexible way to the particular needs of each family. Subsequently, this analysis was translated into a new participatory tool with which families designed their own reconstruction housing. This led to 25 different projects which rescued the traditional ways of inhabiting this, the, the place and at the same time, consider the needs and particularities of each family. The construction system of the housing model responds to the natural and local materials available, as well as to the demand and to, of the families to carry out the reconstruction of their home through, a, through assisted self-construction processes. For this reason, the model consists of compacted earth blocks and that the community can produce and assemble during the construction process thus promoting the family's participation in the design of strategies for the production of their homes. Currently, the project is financed with public, public resources, federal reconstruction program of the National Housing Commission, Commission, and 16 families are leading the construction processes of their homes through several social production schemes that benefit the efficiency of their subsidy. The integrated perspective that participation and interculturality share supposes the ability to communicate with each other from the knowledge and understanding of their culture. In this regard, we rely on different dynamics of participatory processes that enable us to open the dialogue and integrate the different perspectives of actors and users for the design of the project form and program. Such is the case of the Child, Childbirth Houses project carried out in conjunction with the network of Celtal midwives, Un Solo Corazón, which aims to reduce the maternal and infant mortality rate in the indigenous region of Los Altos de Chiapas. Because the midwives did not have the technical constructive knowledge, we developed in conjunction with the young team of architects Armando Casas, a participatory model that allows us to designed together and break the language barrier between Celtal and Spanish. The design of the instrument and its components is based on the understanding of the place, the traditional typologies and the vernacular constructive systems, which help the midwives recognize the forms and proportions of the possible project solutions. During this exercise, we could observe the midwives could, uh, we could observe that the midwives could solve almost immediately the functioning of the space because they know the particular needs of their vocation. However, they found difficulties in the technical constructive aspects. On the contrary, when the husband participated in the sessions, we recognized that it was much easier to solve the constructive system first, since men are used to build a vernacular house in the Celtal communities. This dynamic showed how gender roles and our life experience modified the way we perceive, understand, and do architecture. Mexico is at a crucial moment. We're standing before a panorama of patrimonial and cultural loss that requires us to rethink our role as citizens and professionals. 
it is no longer enough to exercise our profession with a partial vision of the panorama. It is no longer enough to consider that if our profession practice is located in urban areas, we are exempt from all the problems that exist in rural areas. The national territory belongs to everyone and the loss of natural and cultural resources directly impacts each one of us. It is time to recognize that there is a symbiotic relationship between urban and rural areas. Also, from our perspective, it is time to recognize that we must reflect in a self-critical and profound way on a patriarchal violence, on the patriarchal violence and the acts of domination over women that are produced from our profession. Different types of violence against women, such as the violence, they do not operate in isolation. On the contrary, these violence are part of, the, of an interdependent, interdependent and articulated system that generates great social inequities. This is why we consider it fundamental to think together collectively, consistently and ethically the ways of managing, designing and producing our habitat. It becomes urgent to recognize the participa participation as a human right that allows breaking with such violence and acts of domination over women by making them, their families and communities visible, promoting their participation in, in intercultural and intercultural dialogues, respecting their right to self-determination, recognizing their territorial knowledge and integrate them into all decision-making processes on the management, production and sustainability of their habitat. As Rita Segato says, we must dream, but not the dreams of the patriarch. We must be inspired by the time and the towns where women had and still have their own dreams. Finally, our practice is related to a constant exercise of denunciation, democracy, social justice, and defense of human rights, through which we advocate the construction of an inclusive, collaborative, and congruent society where inhabitants are recognized as subjects of action and arrange public policies of our country and therefore the historical reality of their communities. A society where midwives is valued, who learn through dreams to bring children to the world, a country where education is congruent with the place, the aspirations of young people and reinforces the family and social nucleus, a Mexico where our pre-Hispanic culture and our memory is not valued only in museums, but is dignified in each of the 68 indigenous groups that exist today and keep our cultural richness alive. In the search for sustainable futures, and as the Zapatista movement has expressed since decades ago, we work for the construction of a world where many worlds can be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jessica. What an amazing and, and rich practice. Thank you very much. We, we will jump straight to Anna, if it's okay, Jessica, and then we will have a discussion afterwards. Um, obviously, Anna comes from a very different part of the world with very different kinds of, of um, uh, questions. Um, but I hope that um, we can generate a good uh, discussion afterwards. So um, I will also just introduce um, uh, Alia, sorry, Alia. <laughs> who is a PhD student at Stuttgart University and she will introduce uh, you Anna. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Ale and I'm very happy to be able to introduce Anna Dinell. As a head of sustainability at Vasakonen, Anna Dinell has overall responsibility for the company's sustainability strategy. Anna began her career in the property industry in the mid 90s and joined Vasakonen in 1999. Since then, she has held various positions, including that of head of business unit in Stockholm. Anna received her master's degree in civil engineering from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in 95. As a head of sustainability, and has been part of transforming the Swedish property industry, where Vasa Kronen is now considered the industry leader, also including playing a key role in founding a green building council in Sweden, introducing green leases to the Swedish market, and issuing the world's first corporate green bond in November 9, uh, 2013. 
As head of sustainability, she has also been given the opportunity to engage in how to combat the environmental threats facing humanity without infringing upon companies' profitability and people's well-being. Along with her position at Wasserkronen, Anna also holds and has held position as member of the advisory board for Swedish Smart Grid, appointed by Swedish government, member of the advisory board for wood construction, appointed by the Nordic Council of Ministers. She is also a chairwoman of Hal Nolan, Zero Accidents in Construction Industry, as well as board member of Sol Companiet AB, Mistra Cambo Exit, and Elephant 30. Anna is well-known presenter and lecturer both in Swedish property industry and in various universities and institutions in Sweden. In Mar March 2013, Anna was appointed the Stockholmer of the Month for her contributions to a more sustainable society. In October 2015, she was appointed Person of the Year in the Build of Honor by organization Samhels Bugana, I hope that's right, <laughs> Swedish Professionals for the Build and Environment. In April 2018, she was awarded Green Build Europe Leadership Award, and in March 19, she got the award Sweden's Best Sustainability Director, following by December 20, honorary award by Stockholm's Book Nines Hörring, Jubilee Fund. Uh, oh. For the last six years, Anna has also been appointed one of the Sweden's 100 most powerful environmentalists. Anna, we are very welcome to have you here, and the floor is yours. Wow, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I would like to share a small presentation with you tonight. And good evening, good morning, everyone, from a very cold and freezy, wintry Stockholm. Uh, at Vasa Kronan, we have an ambition to run our business in a sustainable way. And that is important for various reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that it's mandated by, by our owners. Um, we are owned by four stately controlled pension funds here in Sweden. And the intent uh, behind owning Vasa Kronan is, of course, to get uh, get, uh, get a profit or, or get the return on their investment, but never if it hurts the environment or people or the society around us. So we need to do this to deliver on, on um, our owner's mandate. But it is also important if we are supposed to deliver on our vision of future-proof cities for everyone where people and companies thrive. And when we talk about running our business in a sustainable way, it um, covers all the dimensions of sustainability. It covers environmental aspects as well as social aspects. And if we look at the environmental focus of our business, we've defined four important topics or aspects about it. We need to reduce our energy consumption. We manage 170 buildings here in Sweden, and we also have a large development portfolio. And of course, energy consumption is really important. But material is also very important environmental and sometimes also forgotten environmental topic uh, about uh, real estate business. Do you know how much material it requires to construct or develop one square meter of an office building? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Yes. Of course, it uh, differs depending uh, on what type of construction materials uh, you are using and where the building is situated and how many stories, of course. But at least we know in our construction projects because we track um, data about the construction material in all projects. And we know it varies from over a thousand kilograms a square, square meter a year and down to 500, depending on construction material, as I said. Waste is another important topic and also transportation, which might uh, sound a little silly because there is nothing, not, nothing as still as a building, right? But when we um, 
uh, let our buildings to different tenants, there is a need for transportation and there is also a huge need for transportation in the actual construction of a new building. We also take um, social responsibility um, into consideration when we want to run our business in a sustainable way. And uh, this is not my focus for today, but I just wanted to show you that it's not only about the environmental uh, impact of uh, our business. As a company, when you've defined how you impact people, society and the environment. There are different tools to actually fulfill something or to, to um, reduce your impact if it is negative. One tool is to set um, ambitious targets to actually fulfill something. And we did that uh, in terms of the energy consumption in our portfolio many years ago. It was back in 2009. The target was to become 50% below industry average. As, and as you can see, we have uh, delivered on that target. Around 2017, we could conclude that we were around 50% below industry average and the overall consumption uh, has decreased by more than 60% since then. And as a consequence of that, by, by reducing the energy consumption in our existing buildings and in our development projects, and by shifting to renewable energy sources, we've been able to reduce our climate impact by more than 90% since 2006. But a few years ago, we started to track not only our direct emissions and, and the indirect emissions related to the energy we need, um, for our business, but also the indirect other climate uh, impact or carbon emissions. And if I include those emissions for the year 2020, this is what it looked like. looks like. The blue bars are the same, but to be able to fit the indirect emissions for 2020, I had to double the scale. And what are these? emissions. Well, this is emissions related to our construction work and some of the activities uh, related to, to uh, the tenants' use of the premises. So what now? Well, it is time for a new challenging target. The first is to become climate neutral in the whole value chain until 2030. And the second is to become self-sufficient in terms of energy demand in all our existing buildings, including the development pro uh, portfolio. And the third is uh, that we're not supposed to generate any waste that cannot be recycled or reused. And it's not only the waste that we are creating, it's also all the waste that we collect from our tenants. And the last is that we're supposed to only use renewable, reuse, or materials created by recycled content in all our construction uh, activities. And this is long-term targets supposed to be met by 2030. And they are really, really challenging. And now we really need to do things in a different way. The first thing is we've started to shift from concrete and steel frames in our, uh, in our development projects. And this is a picture from an uh, office um, development project in Uppsala, which is nearly finalized and the tenants are starting to move in right now. Another thing that we are doing is that we are actually reconsidering how much new square meters we're supposed to develop. Maybe we're already well equipped in terms of square meters in this part of the world. And this is a picture from the city center of Stockholm. A few years ago, or we own a block. Uh, it's a large block with buildings uh, comprising almost 65, thousand square meters. And a few years ago, the only tenant in, in this uh, block, a bank, 
chose to move to another location. So we had the possibility to do something else with this block. And we invited three different architectural firms to come up with ideas on what to do with this um, uh, site. And guess what? Two out of three firms came back with the idea that we should tear down the whole block and start from scratch developing new buildings. The third one suggested we should <clears throat> uh, remake and with, uh, uh, with some adjustments and by adding a few floors to the existing buildings, create new square meters, but keeping the most of it. And that's the idea we chose to go with. And now the project is, uh, is finalized. We managed to save 65,000 square meters of existing concrete frame and basement. <clears throat> and we also reused the facade. So the building that you can see in front of you right now has a granite facade. And uh, uh, instead of just uh, throwing it away, we took it down, uh, washed it, and then replaced it or uh, put it back on the facade when the building was um, um, in, in its uh, finalization stage. The third thing is, and it, this might uh, sound strange when I've just uh, talked about the, this uh, project in Stockholm, but this is a project in Gothenburg where we actually uh, had to decide, or we, we had uh, we had to decide to tear down a building, and that is because the building is situated along the Göta Elm River in Gothenburg, and the municipality is now climate adapting the whole area, and the, the street levels are going to be higher, more than one meter. So this building actually doesn't fit to the new. Um, street grid any longer. So it was a decision which uh, was hard to uh, make, but anyhow, we had to do it. But then we decided that if we're now going to tear down the building, actually, we don't want to tear it down. We want to re uh, or disassemble it and have the goal to reuse or recycle all the material that this building consists of. And now this work is finalized and we didn't actually get to 100, but most of the material in this building has been already reused in other development projects run by us or other developers, or it has been stored to be used in the new building that will be developed on the, the same site, which we hope uh, to start develop uh, very soon. It will be a timber building consisting with a lot of interior reused building material. And another thing that we're also doing, because in this part of the world, real estate owners or property owners typically do the fit out work for tenants. I know it's not the case in other parts of the world, but this is what we do. And it is included in the rent. And uh, for us as a large real estate owner, we do a lot of these projects each year because tenants are moving out, a new one is moving in. And we actually need to do something about the premises, even if we don't want to uh, use so much material. Because if you, for instance, uh, uh, if, if, if the premises were used uh, by a dentist and they move out, then now it's going to be left to a law firm, I think everybody understands that we need to do something about uh, the interior. But that work can be done with reused building or interior material. So if you look at this picture, can you guess what type of construction material or interior uh, design material we have been using? Take a close look and guess. 
it's actually all of it. Every single piece of the interior is reused, except for the coffee beans in the coffee machine. And this is also a concept where we have re uh, we have been rethinking the business model, because typically we let um, let the part of a building without furniture and without uh, the interior uh, the, or the the furniture. But nowadays we are actually letting offices with uh, which are totally equipped with. Uh, furniture and coffee machines and everything else that a company needs to be able to to run their business and uh, we're not only doing that but we are also giving them another type of lease agreement which is not as strict as it used to be so you can actually leave the premises with a three months notice uh, any uh, any time and this means that the tenants are not uh, tied to a long and <laughs> financially heavy burden uh, lease agreement. Um, but, but, by doing, but by giving them the opportunity to actually move out when it suits them, we can also um, change this way of doing the fit up work where we do it and they, it's a more of a... Uh, if it suits you, then then uh, you can uh, lease it. If it doesn't suit you, then you will have to choose something else. So why do we do this? I started by telling you that we have to do it because our owners mandate it from us. And we have to do it to be able to deliver on our vision. But we also do it because we know this is profitable. By doing this, we have increased the profitability within the company in many ways. And first of all, by reducing our environmental impact, by reusing more building material, um, by decreasing the amount of waste we create, we have been able to, uh, to, to decrease our costs significantly. For instance, if you reuse building materials, the cost for that material uh, varies from zero. If it's um, sourced within our own company, we don't have to pay anything for the material because we already own it, to maybe one third or 50% of the price of an equivalent new material. So there are enormous amounts of money to, uh, to save by reusing more building material. Another way where we see an effect on the profitability is on the rents. We see that environmentally certified buildings actually um, have higher rents than um, other buildings uh, that are not certified. It varies from five to 10%. Maybe it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but it is actually uh, a, a lot when it comes to rent. And what is interesting is that if you can um, assume that that higher rent is going to last for a long time, and it is probably going to do that because you have already done the environmental work and uh, certified the asset, it will actually uh, have an impact on the property value, which is also very important uh, from a profitability perspective if you are a property owner. It's not only about increased rents, it's also about uh, increased property values. But there are actually other reasons for higher property values related to your enhanced profit uh, in uh, sustainability. And that is because uh, green buildings are actually um, related to a lower risk because of a higher liquid liquidity in, in the market. If we are selling a green building to another investor, it is always much easier to find new investors because there are many investors out there who only want to buy green buildings and not brown buildings. And last but not least, 
we see that this work is um, affecting our possibilities to finance the business. Currently, we are one of the larger, uh, largest borrowers uh, in the Swedish uh, the market with a high demand on uh, debt uh, uh, capital. Uh, and we finance it by traditional bank loans, but also in the bond market. And in November 2013, we issued the world's first green corporate bond. And at that time, we could see that we tripled the amount of investors who wanted to buy our bonds. And since then, we've seen um, interest rates that are significantly lower uh, when we compare to other types of loans and bonds, uh, which are not green. So in total, by reducing your environmental impact, and especially in the development projects by reusing building materials, you actually have the possibility to become more profitable. And because of the topic today, I thought maybe I could share uh, an example of inspiration, because sometimes I, I get the question, where do you find inspiration to your work? And where do you look to, to get new examples on how you can improve in terms of sustainability? And what we do is that typically we look at other real estate developers and real estate owners in other parts of the world. But what we also do is that we look into other sectors. And uh, this is a screenshot from um, a small outdoor apparel company in Sweden called Houdini. And they are really into sustainability. And this is like their first or their, their um, um, front page on their web page. And I really like the way they uh, communicate. But, and a few years ago, I came across their design principles for producing outdoor garment. And this is what it looked like. Before starting a new production, they ask themselves, does this product deserve to exist? Will it last long enough? Is it versatile enough? Will it age with beauty? Nothing added that isn't needed, right? Is it fit for sharing, repairing, remaking and reselling? Does it have a next life solution? And the first time I saw this design principle, I thought, well, this might be logical if you're designing a jacket, a ski jacket or something else to put on your body. But it would not make sense for buildings, right? And then I read them once again and started to think. And I actually found out that all of them applies to buildings. Maybe I think I would like to rephrase the sec or, or the, the seventh one, the is it fit for sharing, repairing, remaking and reselling. And I think for buildings, maybe what you should be asking you instead of that is, is it fit for a changing climate? And with that small adjustment, I think this is what we all need to do if we're working in the built environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm sorry for this um, black space. I hope you know that we're all taking notes behind our closed cameras. I, I realized earlier today it was a bit confusing when the cameras went on and off all the time, so we <laughs> kept them off. But thank you so much. I think it's a really wonderful double presentation. And I'll leave the um, discussion um, moderation to Martha. Um, and uh, oh, I can't see you, Martha. But um, maybe she will want to steer us through here. And we can see that there's quite a few questions coming in here also, which is very nice. Is Meta still with us here? I'm here, Meta, and, and yep, I'm here. It's and um, 
Anna and Jessica, thank, thank you so much. Um, very different presentations than the first part of the symposium, but um, extremely useful and helpful to sort of bring our feet back onto the ground. And there are, there are many questions. So maybe, um, maybe if we start with one to each of you and then we can uh, have a dialogue about some sort of um, uh, larger issues. There, there is a question, Jessica, um, about uh, about mapping, um, and it. it um, let me just pull it up here. Um, can you elaborate on your use of co-creative mappings? And the um, writer says that she sees them as a form of scripture that calls forth qualities describing relations to land and spaces in new ways. So could you comment on that? And then um, could you talk about uh, how that mapping or representational methods was um, um, imparted in architectural education in your own and if there are any positive or negative aspects to that? So Jessica, I'll turn it, the floor to you. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, yes, of course. Uh, well, participatory maps are one of the many tools that we um, we use in several social processes. But the main importance of this participatory tool is based uh, on on uh, on a strategy to give a social space to open dialogue where many persons can speak about all the knowledge that they have uh, behind related to their history, to the traditional ways of living, and that it is not based in any book, in any, in any other documentation, but just in the experience of living of those places. And also to understand the systemic view of the community uh, in terms of the relationships between the eco in ecological terms, uh, social terms, cultural terms, historical terms. So in this way, we try to use these participatory maps to interrelate all the different aspects and to try to have a, a reflective dialogue with the communities about this systemic view. And through this systemic view is one of the, the base parts of the social process through which we can have a profound understanding of the place, a profound understanding of their culture and the ways, the philosophy and the ways of living. Uh, and from that point, it, uh, we can have much more information to try to design in a collaborative way with the community, the next participatory uh, tools for design and also for um, trying to define uh, uh, collectively the strategies for uh, construction, the strategies for uh, the different social groups that are going to um, uh, to control all the different processes inside the community and also to define um, uh, within the community which are going to be the principal actors inside this social process, but through um, this distribution of power and not to try to put just one person decide this of the community deciding everything, but everything has to be in a concession, in a negotiation. So this like kind of a, of a trigger to uh, a trigger to, to um, see wh which are going to be the, the next uh, participatory strategies. And also in that, that for projects that where we have to design um, a space, in a collective way, but also we use those uh, participatory maps when um, a social group wants to um, have a reflective process with other groups of the community around all the ideas about memory and history that can get all the all those um, uh, historical narratives and important narratives that can bring uh, to the present all the ways of living that were uh, that this community had on the past and that have been transformed with these uh, urban developments or the ideas of of development through a gro globalized view. So the so uh, processes of of rescuing memory are very important uh, also through these participatory maps and also this so in this way they trigger 
the uh, reflective process inside the community through their own way of thinking and through their own way of wanting to uh, evolve in their local terms, not in a global term. Great, thank you. Just one related to this, and then I'll move on. I have a question for Anna, but related to this, um, it's clear that representational methods that are taught in architectural education are far from neutral. Um, and have, could you reflect on um, your own education and um, are you in some ways responding to your own, the biases in your own education through the work that you do in your studio? Or are there things that you're doing now that you're doing in direct contrast to um, aspects of your own education? <laughs> that is a very good question. Uh, yes, we are, since we have been working together in these uh, social processes, we understood that all the tools that we have since uh, our, um, since the university, um, those tools did not work for us in any sense, uh, because in the university, they teach you this uh, vertical way of seeing our profession and in a colonial a way of acting in community social processes. We had to understand that in architecture, you can have different logics uh, by which you can act. And the, the kind of projects that we accompany are social projects that do not have this interest about uh, only based on aesthetics or only based on power or only based in, uh, in economic terms. So, we had to use completely different um, uh, tools that are based in this concept and vision of social production of habitat, uh, which help us to understand a completely different role of the architect that is much based in accompanying, in accompanying the social groups with which we are collaborating in a horizontal way. And for that, you have to co-create to design in a collaborative way, not just the spaces, but you have to design a, in a collaborative way, also the strategies, the way of thinking, and to understand creativity, not just for the design of a space, but creativity mainly used for the design of strategies. So process strategy are, so are one of the uh, main concepts that we um, where we put our energy more than in aesthetics, more than in design, more than in form, no? Uh, so we had to understand another way of, of seeing our profession, just as uh, Ivani Illich expresses, no? That the professions are taking us to a, to a concept of the world where only the people who have studied a profession have the knowledge to know how to do things. So we have to get that away from our mind and we have to collaborate in a horizontal way. And all the things that we have learned in the past years are, have been mainly uh, built in relationship with the people we have, with which we are working and to understand other ways, other worlds that wanted to be uh, developed uh, uh, very different from the global uh, view. Great, right. thank you so much. Anna, I'm smiling because there are questions for you, Anna, about the business model and um, uh, directing a school that's the daughter of a, a business school. I'm smiling because um, I can hear these questions in the master in real estate development uh, and the city courses that, that we have. So, um, this new business model that you've proposed or that you're using. Uh, does it um, does it encourage you to consider the type of materials that you'll use for new builds in the future? In other words, does it encourage you to look at materials that are more easily recycled or are of higher quality? Um, and then, then there's a question related to that. It's about the cost of disassembly in Gothenburg. And how does it compare to regular? I'm smiling because cost is one thing, value is another, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and, and then related to this business model, it's, um, 
If it's so profitable, the um, listener asks, why aren't more developers around the world following suit? So Anna, there are some business related questions. Talk about getting your feet on the ground. So take it away, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very good questions, all three of them. Uh, the first one has a very simple answer, yes. Of course, uh, we see or we look at our buildings at, as material banks for the future. So definitely. And that's another reason why we chose to shift to timber as a construction material, because a timber building is much more easy to disassemble than a concrete building. Um, but, but also on the interior side and, and other types of, of building material that we are using, uh, from gypsum boards to um, ventilation and channels and everything. Uh, so for instance, nowadays, I don't know, it, do you call it the ventilation pipes or channels or I don't know the, the right term for it. But be, um, before we used to screw them, uh, use screws to, to put them into place but now we're using like bands instead because then we won't destroy them so it's easier to disassemble and reuse them other other in in another building so definitely this has changed the design process uh, and something to take into consideration both in new development projects but also in, in small fit out works how can we reuse this uh, uh, this thing if it's not needed here within two years or three years or 10 years? The second question was about the disassembly project, right? And, and if it um, um, costed more. Yes, it did, <clears throat> definitely. So if we would only look at that cost, maybe it would have prevented us from going with that option. But now it's part of the whole restructure of that site and also the new development that, or the new building that we will create or develop on that site. And we know that uh, this will definitely be an important part of the overall environmental impact of the new building because we had to take away the old building to be able to replace it with the new one. And we know from dialogues with tenants, because we're, we are um, uh, a commercial real estate owner owning office and, and retail buildings. And we know that for the companies that uh, <clears throat> lease our buildings, it is really, really important to them to, to go for the lowest environmental impact possible uh, when they lease uh, uh, premises. And one example of that is the timber office building in Uppsala. There was an article in the local newspaper when we got the building permission for that building because it was the first uh, large office timber building in Sweden. Uh, so we got a lot of publicity and uh, companies actually started to call us asking, is there any space left for us? Because we really want to have our new office in that building. And that's not the way it usually <laughs> works, uh, uh, leasing office spaces. We have to call the, the companies or the, the, um, uh, rep the prospects and, and not them calling us. So yes, it was, um, it, it did cost more, but uh, we see it on the overall level for that project. It will, uh, we will get the payback on that uh, larger investment. And another thing is, uh, when I look back on uh, different environmental um, initiatives that we've taken, uh, in the beginning, you always calculate a higher cost. How much more will it cost? But after a few times when you've done it, you kind of not think if it is profitable on an overall level, you don't, you don't actually uh, count on that extra cost. I sometimes uh, uh, compare it with elevators. When elevators were new, all developers uh, were, were looking at the cost. How much does an elevator cost? But nowadays, any, no one is doing that because 
you need an elevator in an office building because otherwise you will not get the building permission. Okay. And and the third part is um, you said that there are pension funds that are investing. And of course, pension funds, um, they look for long term, low risk. Um, mm-hmm. But the question from the audience is, well, yes. are there why? other companies? Are there other companies? And mm-hmm. why aren't other companies taking this more um, sustainable or responsive, responsible mm-hmm. point of view? Uh, I think nowadays many more real estate developers and real estate companies are trying to become more sustainable. We take part in a global uh, sustainability benchmark for real estate companies. It's called GRESP. And when we started to participate in that more than 10 years ago, I think there were like 200 respondents or something. And now it's I think 1,500 or something. And I know a lot of uh, real estate companies are trying to become more sustainable. Uh, But I think maybe uh, when it comes to reusing building material, not tearing down older buildings, replacing with new and so forth, maybe not all companies yet see the profitability in doing so. Um, And um, there are many reasons. We are a large player in in the cities where we have uh, business, we are large players and we can can, um, actually reuse a lot of building materials internally. But to be able to do that, if you are a smaller player, you need an ecosystem where you have other participants doing that because otherwise it will not work. And um, by being a large player, we've also been able here in Sweden, we've been able to create new ecosystems. So we actually have competitors uh, buying our material and then maybe next month we are buying from them. So. Um, it is maybe it is not profitable when you start, or maybe it's not even possible to start on your own. So you actually have to to um, say, align yourself with your competitors, with architects, with constructional engineering uh, engineers, construction uh, companies, and so forth to be able to do it. Otherwise, it will not be profitable. Thank you, Anna. This brings me back to Jessica about the question of scale, because Anna just talked about creating an ecosystem to be able to scale up. Jessica, your your projects are extremely sensitive and very community oriented. Um, Do you see a way to scale up uh, in what you're doing? Um, Is there an extension of the individual projects beyond the beyond the project or is that does that have to be done by your office testing a model and then taking it to other places so how how do you see how do you see jessica the idea of um scaling up the work that you do we have talked a lot about this this aspect in uh, in a network uh, where a lot of uh, civil organizations based in latin america also work with this view of social production of habitat. And we have discussed that one of the, two of the main uh, important aspects related to uh, scaling uh, this um, way of producing architecture in a social way is based in uh, that more people, more, more young students or more young professionals or more uh, social organized social groups uh, can work together uh, in trying to collaborate through this view um, not ju- not try to be based on uh, more funds or more subsidies from public policies but mainly in the collaboration between of a uh, of a greater network of civil organizations uh, that can accompany all those families that want to produce uh, their homes or their common spaces uh, in a collaborative uh, way. So uh, in that term, um, uh, education is, is one, of the, one of our best tools no? to try to um, explore uh, other ways of making architecture sy- uh, 
from from the from from the universities, and also um, to try to uh, accompany different groups uh, of families that they can replicate or they can be um, assisted of uh, by different uh, groups of architects or technicians that can help them to produce their own ways of living and to to produce uh, to self produce their own spaces so they do not depend also in external aid or they do not depend on uh, external uh, funds so in that way um, an integral accompaniment based on social and technical uh, processes, and also a, a, a view based on autonomy and not independence can help to scale this way of, of working. And also if we can see the context in which we have been working in Latin America, more than 60% of the of the family of the population self-produce their own spaces, but without any assistance. Uh, you can see that that in the in in the main cities, and also you can now see it in the in the rural uh, populations when they are transforming their ways of living in, with the use of industrialized materials in a completely different way of understanding now the the territory. So um, that seventy percent of the population can have this self-assisted. Uh, 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 and so an integral accompaniment. So we need more more people that work with this view, no, and that could scale this process, because it's not it is not the a greater scale. It will not be based on professionals or in politicians. It will be based on uh, the accompaniment for these families. Thanks, Jessica. I, I wanted to ask both um, um, a question about listening and listening to the local community. And, and I think you, your contexts are very different. And maybe, Jessica, yours is much more direct um, in the way you presented listening to the local community. But um, can you talk about what was the most unexpected consequence or unexpected outcome as you listened to one of the, the local communities? Was there something that um, was really a shock to you in the way they approached something? Was there a great learning experience? Maybe you could tell us something. And Anna, then I will come back to you with the same question. How do you listen to the local communities? Who is your local community in Sweden? So Jessica, a surprise, something, uh, a revelation uh, through your listening to local local communities. Last year, there was a very big um, learning that we have uh, working in, in Ixtepec in Oaxaca, where we uh, achieved to see that you can always use the word community, no? Uh, but community is it's based on many different social groups that have different ways of thinking, different logics. There are different actors with different ways of seeing the problem or seeing the objective of this of the social process. And we understood that um, you can say that you are working with a community, you are working with one social group that may have that you may think that they have uh, one view of the of the of the future of the process, but you have to understand since the beginning the different logics of the different and the different actors that are are uh, of the project which uh, on which it is uh, based on which it is composed to see to try to develop strategies to um, distribute this power. So power, logic, actors are one of the main things that we have to understand since the beginning, because uh, we um, had to face a situation on which we were working with, a, with different uh, social groups, with different actors, and each of them had different ways of seeing the process. One of them had wanted to control all the social processes. So it was, it was acting in a political um, view, in a political logic that changed everything, all the course of the social process. And uh, we had to understand that if since the beginning we had understood all those logics and all those actors and everyone 
would talk and debate and negotiate between those different logics will have been much easier in the in the next processes. So it doesn't matter if it is a local social group, uh, uh, it will not um, have um, a, a social a social view of the process because it is a local group. So it, it was a very interesting uh, way of of understanding uh, that you have to under you have to understand all the actors that are going to be collaborating and all the logics of these actors to try to make new strategies for them. Thank you. And Anna, who are your local actors and do they have different strategies? Um, yes, they do. Um, it's, it's a really good question. What are our communities? Typically, our buildings are located in central district district areas of, of larger cities, where we typically see uh, very few residents. So the people spending time there are either um, office workers uh, spending time between eight um, and in, in the morning and six in the evening. Um, others like um, city residents uh, that, that don't live in our areas but spend time in the city to visit theaters, restaurants, bars and, and nightclubs and, and shops. Um, so actually one thing that we want to create is more residents, uh, people actually living in, in our communities because we think that creates a better environment uh, for people. So in the Sergel Husum project that I mentioned about in, in the center of Stockholm, we actually created 14 new apartments in that block uh, where we didn't have any residents before. Uh, and we also created new spaces in like in the street level to get more open spaces where people spend time during more hours <laughs> during uh, the, the, the day and nights. Mm. But I also think when, when answering that question, I understand that the planning process differs a lot in, the, in different parts of the world. So in Sweden and in, in the other Nordic countries, I believe, um, the municipalities actually have the, the, this, the single power and they actually decide what we can do with our buildings and what we cannot do. And therefore it's actually a cooperation together with them to try to influence their decisions uh, uh, because sometimes maybe to be honest, their opinion on what is a good uh, neighborhood or good um, uh, um, part of the city might differ from our view. Thank, thanks, Anna. I'll go back to, to Jessica. Um, um, there, there are questions for you, Jessica, about um, alternative uh, financial models of private ownership. Um, so they want to know from you a little bit more about disruptive practices. And there was one question about disruptive practices for you, Jessica, in terms of materials, but also it sounds to me like disruptive practices in terms of ownership or modes of co-ownership. So maybe you could address that. Do you see the work that you do as trying to be disruptive and if so in what ways and and do you think it's being successful and then Anna, i'm going to come back to you after that about also about measuring impact after the fact and post occupancy but jessica would you take the first questions on disruption and alternative modes uh of, of um, ownership or use of materials things that you're trying to accomplish in your work Yes, thank you. Um, well, yes, maybe uh, uh, the, the word disruptive may be uh, uh, one of the characteristics, but we prefer emancipatory design that has a very ideological um, profound way of understanding that uh, our, our profession can accompany um, processes related to the search of autonomy. So in that way, uh, it deconstructs 
a way of thinking based on a profession related to racism, to colonialism, to patriarchy. So in that terms, uh, we prefer the word, the word emancipatory because that put us in a, in a stage where ethical uh, processes or eth an ethical view is much more important than many other things on which sometimes architecture is based on. So ethics is one of the, uh, also one of our uh, main uh, tools that we use to define the way on which we um, accompany communitary uh, processes is like a, a guideline for us to decide. So, uh, and also in these reflective self-critical uh, processes, not just uh, from the community of, of the way they relate with their environment, with their culture, with their, with their history and their future, but also self-critical processes that we have within ourselves uh, on which we have to be uh, trying to co uh, correlate with different uh, other professions in interdisciplinary ways uh, of understanding uh, architecture by, uh, by geography, anthropology, sociology, uh, etc. And also to try to have a more integral view of our way of understanding the world, but in a, in a reflective way also based in this idea or this target of eman emancipatory uh, design. And this is also related, for example, on the way that we conceive materials. For example, if you understand participatory architecture in this systemic way, you have to correlate the productive and economic aspects with the environmental aspects, with the social and cultural aspects with the political and normative aspects, everything is correlated, everything is a system. So you have to be uh, understanding, um, for example, today we're talking a lot, a lot about materials. You have to understand the use of materials and the reflective processes about natural materials against industrial materials with the community, with this systemic view, with this systemic reflective understanding of the environment. And uh, in that way, we will never impose an idea to use just only natural materials or just only industrial materials. So the selection of the materials, the selection of the social processes will, are going to be based on this systemic view, on this systemic understanding that has to be accompanied, accompanied by a self-reflection self processes. So that is like the, the, the round thing that we try Great. to do. Great, thank you, Jessica. And Anna, um, going, going back to you, um, my, my question has to do with, do you do post-occupancy analysis of the buildings to see what's working, what you want to change in the future? And related to that, um, has COVID-19 uh, made, uh, made your firm think about uh, buildings in a different way? Has there been an added aspect to either sustainability or well-being that is forcing a shift in the way you approach and the outcome of those buildings? Uh, yes, we certainly do post-occupancy uh, reviews. And actually, I don't think there is much interesting to find in that. Uh, so maybe I can uh, move on to your second question about COVID. There are a lot of things that we are now uh, thinking about. Um, and one thing is that pre-pandemic office buildings in this part of the world, I think maybe that's true for many parts of the world, but at least here, were used 10% of the time. So it is highly inefficient <laughs> use of uh, resources. Uh, and now we know that they are even used uh, less than that because uh, for a few months we, we um, almost kind of uh, um, got back to normal in terms of, of, of uh, the way we live. But we saw in, in all our buildings that the occupancy did not come back to what it was before the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know how much uh, it will affect the vacancy rates, but it will probably do in the future. Of course, many companies are um, uh, leasing premises with uh, fixed uh, lease contracts, so they cannot um, uh, lease less square meters right now, but it will uh, uh, have an effect on the market. So what I think, that this is my personal view, I think what we will see in many countries going forward is that there will be a lot of unused office buildings that could potentially be used as other things because maybe there is a lack of residential units and so you, maybe you could convert buildings. But I know for sure that in many countries there will be difficulties because of building regulations and so it's not just... or. It's not that the building cannot be used for other purposes, but if you want to use it for other purposes, you will get stuck with so many regulatory aspects, so you will not uh, be able to do it. Uh, on the other side, on the health uh, side, it could actually be the other uh, thing uh, or the opposite, uh, that the companies need more space because people don't want to to sit in open office spaces, uh, very close to each other. So maybe we will get back to everyone has their own room uh, environment. Actually, I don't think that is going to be the fact, but of course, and also maybe we will see an increase in energy demand because of the need for better ventilation. Um, uh, because we, we want more fresh air to be able to make sure that there are no viruses uh, spreading in our buildings. So I think we will definitely see changes, but it is uh, yet too early to actually say what will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to end end by asking you if you can um, if you can give me a sum up of what you would like the headline to read tomorrow. Considering uh, considering today's um, symposium, and we still have one more speaker, but uh, that it's related to the SDGs. It's related to what I've heard in in all the speakers is um, incredibly interesting research. There seems to be an undercurrent of optimism uh, about change. Um, and Anna, I just heard you say that you would like the building policies to change, but if you could, uh, if you could um, uh, see a headline in tomorrow's newspaper, and that would be related not only to the world, but to your work within the world, what would you like that headline to say? And then Jessica, I'm going to ask you the same thing, but what would you like tomorrow's headline to say? That's a very good question. Um, maybe there would actually be a press release from, <laughs> from our company uh, saying that um, we've decided to stop developing new square meters because we can simply not justify it any longer from an environmental perspective. So everything we will do from now is developed by things that already exist. Fantastic. Anna, thank you so much. And as we say in Spanish, um, from your mouth to God's, to God's ears. And um, Jessica, what would your what would your headline be for tomorrow, um, related to the symposium, to the um, the need to modify our professions and our industries uh, to find new ways of doing things, um, as all the speakers have addressed, and you yourself. Um, maybe we can rescue this idea that through through the social production and management of the habitat, we can uh, uh, try to uh, collaborate through emancipatory design for collective worlds, something related to, to that maybe. Thank you so much, Jessica and Anna. Mm -hmm. And I will turn the floor back over to Meta, um, who will be able to uh, take the next step in this very, very interesting symposium. Thank you to both of you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yes,
Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Anna. It's really been a wonderful session and a very wonderful day. And thank you for joining us from so far away, Jessica. It's wonderful that you don't have to fly around and spend weeks on it, but still, it would have been great to meet you physically. Um, I, I wanted to just shortly say where we are. It's been a very long program. Um, uh, it has been a, a wonderful voyage um, with, with really novel conversations. Um, and we want to end our session here with Alexandre Monin um, and, and uh, our PhD student here in CETA, uh, Adrian Rigobello, will introduce him in a moment. But the idea of this talk is really like an extra so the idea is like you have a keynote at the start, you set the stage, ask some fundamental questions. Then we ask Alexandre to ask us or to point us in a new direction. And so we do not follow this with a, a debate. Um, uh, and we let uh, Alexandre's uh, uh, words uh, resonate into, into the room. So first of all, now uh, uh, Adrian will introduce, and um, and we will also thank you all for taking part today. It's been really, really fantastic. So thank you to all, and, and Adrian, over to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know if Adrian is, is he there? He's having trouble unmuting himself, so ah, he should be able. Okay, yes. Very good. Wonderful. There you are. Thank you. Yeah. That's so great. Um, yeah, so let me introduce Alexandre. Um, so our contemporary design practices have been embracing a rather recent tradition of um, narrative building, packing the latest technological progresses into coherent and interdependent worlds. To confront such golem, understand its mechanics, and form a course of action to urgently address its social environmental impact, it will take a matured and final um, comprehension of the technological infrastructures, the interest of the more than human actants at play, and the mediations these structures enact. Of course, the, central, the centrality of the web in our everyday activities, which importance is well illustrated by the on-trend holistic visions for metaverses, makes it all the more complicated to comprehend the extent, ecological footprints and biases of contemporary technological infrastructures. Alexandre Manon is one of the rare persons confronting this golem. Alexandre is a philosopher of sciences, professor of ecological redirection and design at ESC Clermont Business School in France, and scientific director um, of Origins Media Lab. And his expertise ranges much further. When we met in 2017, Alexandre was, among other things, consulting as a web architect for the Lafayette Anticipa Anticipation um, Contemporary Art Foundation. Back then, he introduced me to an idea he was developing with his friend, the anthropologist Diego Landivar, um, the project Closing Worlds. They would basically reach out to exploitative big companies and wealthy persons in charge and present a blunt diagnostic. The more they exploit, the more it fuels crisis, the less they feel safe, ecologically or socially, and the more they would um, accumulate to feel safe again. It was simply a ruining vicious circle. The idea was not to only um, provide a diagnosis, of course, uh, but to offer to help by redirecting the patient's resources towards the closure of these renews, act renews activities. At the time, Alexandre compared himself this strategy to a voluntarily Buffon-like one, not unlike Chef Kunz's attitude uh, towards wealthy art collectors. Hope lies on informed sabotaging. The sheer drive for addressing the ecological crisis at scale led Alexandre to open in 2020, the first Master of Science um, aiming at actualizing this vision and the program to openly, sorry, and the first program to openly aim at addressing the Anthropocene from an organizational, political, anthropological and designerly perspective. The program is called Strategy and Design for the Anthropocene and is hosted by ESC Clermont Business School in partnership with Strat Design. 
It is with an amused and kindly cynical Latourianity that Alexandre contributes to support um, organizational redirection and with an enthusiastic professional echo in France at the moment. I hope you enjoy Alexandre's keynote and hope too that this encounter contributes to help us redirect design methods, intentions and narratives too. very much thank you very much uh, adrian thank you all for uh, still being there and for the invitation i'm really happy to be to be here and thank you adrian for uh, stating that i'm not uh, an architect myself so i hope what i'm going to say will be uh, relevant to uh, to you all but uh, hopefully so i'm going to uh, share my uh, screen uh, with just a portion of it and that should make the trick Sorry, just a second. You see my, you see my screen? Yes, we see it perfectly. Great, thank you. Um, so, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to deliver this extra. It's the first time I ever deliver an extra, but I think it's a very nice uh, format. Uh, my title is Arts of Closure, and I'm going to be talking about that because this is uh, um, what I'm trying to train people to do, and this is what I'm also developing in my research, and sometimes with connection to the architectural world um, and to issues I think that are relevant to, to you. So I'm going to talk about that. Beginning by talking about a concept that is very important to me and to us because we are uh, there's three of us uh, working on uh, this uh, this program, this research in action uh, program, and a little bit artistic one, as uh, Adrian reminded me. Um, it's a notion of legacy. Actually, in French, it's called héritage, which is the uh, word for heritage uh, as well. But we have one one word in, in, in French for that. But this is uh, here. It's legacy, and it's the legacy of the world we live in. It's a legacy of what Bruno Latour calls the global, um, not just as an ideology stemming out of um, modernity and modernism, but uh, rather has the byproduct of that, of the scientific, um, the industrial revolutions, we could say also the managerial uh, and the design revolutions. Um, and it's all the models and infrastructures that have been built that are sometimes called the uh, uh, technosphere. Here you have a, uh, a small representation, recent one, very recent one from visual capitalists um, of the anthropogenic mass uh, of everything that we've built. But it's not just built, of course, it's also functioning. And so there are all the models behind that um, and behind all those infrastructures. Um, and so whether we like them or not, we are inheriting them, which is, of course, something very important. Uh, and what should we do about that? Uh, well, that's mainly the topic of what we call ecological redirection. We try not to talk anymore of ecological transition because we believe that transition is not enough. And Unlike traditional approaches like corporate social responsibility, sustainable development, green growth, transition, uh, ecological redirection considers that it will not be possible to maintain everything. Um, it will not be possible only by uh, you know, becoming more efficient, even more circular, um, and by compensating to maintain everything that we have right now, which is already too much. Um, and so that means trade-offs will have to be made and actually are already made. So the question is how, which is both a technical and a political uh, question, how to make those trade-offs and uh, how to make them in a planned, democratic way and uh, by being aware of and concerned about the people involved by these trade-offs, by these processes of arbitration. Instead of what we see nowadays, because we already see a lot of trade-offs happening, but mainly there are unplanned authoritarian and people are unaware or unconcerned about the people involved and who are suffering from the consequences of these unplanned and authoritarian trade-offs. 
Um, we actually just, uh, well, we published uh, a book um, at the end of May this year, uh, whose title is Heritage uh, and uh, Legacy and Closure uh, in English, uh, An Ecology of Dismantling. Maybe it will be translated, and we try precisely to articulate this notion of something that we inherit with the necessity of closure. Um, because as I said, we cannot maintain everything. So how can we develop, build these uh, new arts of closure, of um, closing, shutting down things that already exist, but how? And legacy is the first step. Uh, we cannot just uh, uh, decree that they have to disappear or destroy them, which will only uh, fuel the system as it is. Um, and at the same time, inherit the future and sometimes inherit some projects of future technologies, future developments that we already know we cannot absorb uh, or it's a bad idea to absorb them. So how can we inherit what I call obsolete innovations? And this is how with uh, Diego Landiva, we built the, uh, we launched the Closing Walls Initiative uh, that Adrian was uh, kind to mention. Uh, which wanted to be an answer to, to, to that question. And so we, we, we did a some first work into looking at um, initiatives that would be compatible with our nascent at the time program. Um, and we also did some inquiries uh, with what we call uh, collapsed uh, CEOs. So CEOs who have a conscious of what is going to happen, especially in France, because a lot of them are engineers and were very much into the collapse movement, which used to be very strong from uh, 2015 till the uh, advent of the, uh, the, of the COVID. Um, and we later indeed uh, developed this uh, strategy and design for the Anthropocene Master of Science, where our goal is precisely to train people who will be able to face these arbitrations uh, arbitration processes, these trade-offs that are awaiting companies, all the bifurcations that will necessarily happen due to our um, modifications of our living conditions, of our material conditions, of our legal conditions as well, um, consequences uh, that uh, organizations cannot face nowadays, uh, and also institutions and territories. So we're mainly working uh, with those. Uh, to give you examples, we worked on stopping new constructions in um, Ile-de-France, the region around Paris, in order to evaluate not only um, the possibility and the benefits of this perspective, but also its feasibility, moving, for example, towards an economics of renovation and the conversion of building uh, 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 working workplaces into inhabitations being one aspect especially as offices are deserted thanks to COVID adaptation. We also accompany the city of Grenoble in the use of what we call protocols of renunciation concerning the dilapidated municipal swimming pools of the city and their future and possible closure by associating the inhabitants to this uh, investigation, and which was not only an investigation, it's now a political process um, in, in Grenoble, and which can be replicated in uh, about many different topics elsewhere. We also, for example, work with uh, ski resorts uh, who know they're doomed, with parking lot managers who uh, don't necessarily know they're doomed, but uh, uh, um, you know, have a doubt about <laughs> the possibility, with insurers faced with situations that will no longer be insurable under the current conditions and the likes. Um, over two years, we have opened about 30 similar um, commissions. So we have to walk a fine line between two pitfalls. And for me, this is extremely important. Living in the technosphere unharmed, which threatens uh, the habitability of Earth um, in the medium term, or cutting ties with it, with the technosphere, when the survival of a growing part of humanity depends precisely on its attachment and growing attachment to the technosphere. 
Following this path requires taking into account the imperative of closure as well as the subsistence links woven with what needs to be closed in order to dismantle in the most democratic, fairest, and least painful way. The question of technique uh, is therefore absolutely central, uh, as Adrian said, from the point of view, from the point of view of the arts of closure. The goal here is indeed to leave no one behind. And we have to take into account these two different perspectives and find this fine line between the two if we want to do that, if we want to really um, achieve this goal. Um, I'm talking of negative comments. Uh, this is uh, not a concept I was the first to propose, but uh, I didn't know it already had a history um, back in the early 2000s. Um, but I'm, I've been using it since uh, 2017 in a different sense, and then I rediscovered its uh, previous meaning. And I wrote a paper about that if you're interested. But I'm using it um, to show that the contemporary question turns out uh, turns out it's not just how we avoid appropriation of the commons, but rather how we take care of existing realities that no one wants to oversee, like depleted rivers, polluted soils, infrastructures, and disarray and the likes. It's more a question in that sense of uh, institutions maybe than uh, resources. And I'm talking here of what I called ruined ruins. Uh, here you have, for example, a picture of the last coal-fired power facility operated by the U.S. Navy, uh, which was commissioned. And here you have a, a cemetery of flood-damaged cars at the Royal Purple Raceway in Baytown, um, and uh, which shows kind of decommissioned traditional ruins, but uh, uh, still a bit picturesque. Uh, picturesque uh, ruins, uh, but ruins, of course, of the Anthropocene, but I could have chosen different, uh, different ones. Um, this notion of negative commons displaces the question of the resource. I, a, a resource uh, in, understood in the field of the commons, for example, uh, was, uh, you know, the commons rather were understood as mixed between resources, communities, and democratic rules of governance that the communities are giving themselves to manage the resources. And the point was always to avoid the destruction of the resources, which is a common goal shared both by Eleanor Strom and her arch enemy, Gareth Harding, uh, through different means, uh, either through the commons or Strom or private property for uh, Gareth Harding. Um, but the problem is we cannot align with this way, our understanding of negative commons and of what I call bucolic commons, if we understand commons first and foremost as being resources. Uh, rather, we have to understand commoning, that commoning is as an institutional practice through which different realities are being acknowledged, uh, that can be more than human realities, of course, and taken care of whether these realities are positive or negative. And I have a, those can be, these negative comments can be some of the ruined ruins I've been showing you, but they can be also ruining ruins, meaning active ruins, which do not necessarily look like uh, there are ruins. And I've been working for some years at the INRIA, which is a French MIT uh, an institution about, um, uh, Computation sciences. Um, I was I did myself my PhD on the architecture of the web, uh, so I'm deeply involved in all, in all those developments. But still, I consider, for example, that um, lots of well, digital technologies in general nowadays are ruining ruins. If you just look at the imprints of these technologies and how much energy they require and the growth of energy consumption of the sector on a yearly basis, which is about 9%, and a 9% increase on a yearly basis is something absolutely astounding. Um, you understand, um, has been alluded to also, why these are uh, ruining ruins uh, with the consequences or the condition, rather, that you have to have 
um, mines and mining activities, which are, of course, themselves extremely polluting. Uh, wealthy workers are pro-slaves, uh, and all that being quite, quite bad. So we, we have to shift our understanding of ruins and of the, the ruins of the global world we have been inhabiting, uh, the global world of uh, that made us enter into the Anthropocene. Uh, we have to shift from a picturesque view of those ruins to a view where high-tech, top-notch technologies are actually what are uh, uh, the ruins, uh, today's ruins, uh, uh, the most ruining ruins of the state. So this uh, made me ask a question of how we can leave those ruins, whether ruined or ruining, um, by distinguishing between types of negative commons, um, which allow for different relationship to those commons. I won't comment on all that, but if you take, for example, uh, uh, radioactive waste, this is immediately uh, nefarious and you cannot leave in the vicinity of these uh, wastes. So you have to uh, put there somewhere, uh, whether it's in the a former Yucca Mountain project or in Onkalo in, in Finland, uh, to which I think I will go back in a moment. Um, you have to, to, to put it somewhere where people will not uh, dwell. Um, so that, that's one way of relating to something by creating a new taboo, for example, and new uh, zones of exclusion. Um, so it's living with from now on because you cannot get rid of those objects. You have to create these stones to take care of those. Uh, you have living with in a different way. Um, bacteria have been mentioned. You can also mention invasive species, um, elements that are not negative, positive uh, per se, but whose effect depend on the milieu. And you have to cultivate a milieu to live with these elements in, um, in a different way because you get that hope to eradicate them and eradicating them will create other uh, bad effects. Uh, and then you have the living without uh, when the negativity is systemic and infrastructural. And I think that um, um, Digital technologies belong to that, even though, of course, we cannot uh, get rid of them immediately because we're deeply entrenched within these uh, technologies. And sorry for the typo. Um, this is where I'm using the concept of um, uh, physicist um, working in Paris, José Alois uh, from Belgium, uh, who's been talking of zombie technologies and what he understands uh, zombie technology to be is a technology that relies on finite resources with eventually limited availability, uh, even sometimes question of scarcity, but it's really the question of availability, which is the most important one. Um, with uh, minimum time in working condition and maximum duration has waste, and he contrasts this notion with the idea of living technologies, which are based on renewable, uh, which uh, echoes the idea of strong durability, uh, which have a maximum duration in working condition and minimum duration has waste because um, living technologies uh, are part and parcel of uh, biogeochemical cycles, which is not the case of zombie technology. So they're uh, they, they can go back to these cycles, which is not the case of zombie technologies. And unfortunately, most of our technologies uh, today are zombie technologies. So this question of pluralizing technologies is also a very important one because we cannot hope to just you know, uh, uh, forsake technology in general. But we have to look at what kind of technology we're using to open up new ways of dealing with this fundamental relation to uh, technology, which is fundamental to human uh, beings, even though technologies might sometimes be inhuman. Uh, a side note about zombie technologies, um, research on living technologies involved uh, using digital tools, which are examples of zombie technologies. The goal is thus uh, making sure to mobilize them in order to help craft new models that will immediately need to be de-zombified 
um, in terms of technology, of course, but also as regards the underlying economic model that they fuel. Research in that sense is often a negative comment um, itself. Of course, sometimes the argument goes this way. Without digital tool, there will be no IPCC. Sure, but still, overall, the price is a little too steep for this argument to really be uh, um, you know, satisfying. Um, I wanted also to mention a few things about uh, planetary scales because uh, zombie technologies, nor technologies in general, make us touch this notion of planetary scales uh, because digital technology are now the uh, um, elements of the new geological uh, strata that are being produced. I mentioned uh, Onkalo in Finland. Um, and those are interesting examples because through the global, through our infrastructure, through the technosphere, we are now touching upon um, scales that uh, escape our reach and that are not only global, but that are planetary in the sense of uh, Indian historian Dipesh Chakramarty, uh, meaning that uh, uh, they open up scales for uh, millennia, uh, hundreds of uh, thousands, of hundreds of years, and we do not know how to deal with those. And Onkelo is a good example of that because it's trying the infrastructure people have been building. Onkelo are supposed to last for a hundred thousand years, but no civilization, no infrastructure, human civilization, human infrastructure has lasted so long. So it's really a bet and we don't know whether uh, that will work and actually probably will not uh, will not work even though uh, they're trying and it's interesting per se. So it's interesting to see how our own productions forces us to stretch our production on the planetary scale for which they are not tailored. And of course that raises a lot of uh, questions. A side note about uh, living technologies now, it's not about just resilience. I think this point is worth making now because the point is not to use living resources. I wouldn't use the word resources, more than human elements or infrastructures to mitigate the effects of extractive industry. Um, this is uh, only a way to have your cake and eat it, destroy nature and use nature for remediation purpose. Uh, which raises also a lot of questions. Uh, the point is rather to sensibly stop the destruction once the arts of closure without threatening people's lives. This is the fine line I was mentioning earlier. Pierre Quet, French philosopher, is searching, for example, for a way out of what he calls the metaphysics of production and destruction and talks in the context of architecture of in production, in production, or uh, let's say in production, if I had to translate it in, in English. And making room for that, for something like in production is of course something I think which is, well, is something I think which is uh, fundamental. And the arts of closures are also about um, uh, making room for this uh, dimension. Okay, so I will end my talk by talking about what I think is um, absolutely fundamental, which is uh, working towards a general economy of sobriety. Uh, governments and institutions are already projecting scenarios which integrate sobriety as a fundamental factor. For example, in France, a recent report projects a 40% decrease in energy use by 2050. And it's not an overtly sober scenario. Actually, the people doing this report rejected the sober scenario. So that's a kind of new business as usual scenario, the contraction of 40% of the energy spent in the country. And this is not the only country. I mean, it's not a, just a, a French weirdness, right? Um, it's more global uh, than that. Adaptation will now apply to those scenarios of sobriety, which are to be implemented in the coming decades 
whether or not they're already explicitly discussed in the public sphere. And of course, uh, not for the moment really discussed. The scenarios themselves aim to mitigate the effect of climate change and planetary boundaries crossing. But sobriety or frugality, if you want, is seen as somewhat somehow diminutive, which it is, you no know, fairness. Uh, here, it might be counted that interesting to mention the notion of um, a notion I propose of um, extensive sobriety and contrast it with another notion put forward by the anthropologist Eduardo Pivos de Castro, a Brazilian anthropologist. And currently we worked by a young researcher I'm collaborating with uh, named Nathan Ben Um Oh, sorry. Um, our imprint and the imprint of the technosphere will have to shrink. We cannot grow in infinitely in a finite world as we were reminded today. But for the wor world to remain uh, livable, um, how may we find infinity in this finite world? It's reminiscent of the already mentioned Zapatist motto, a world of many worlds. That's the point precisely of intensive sufficiency. Through repetition, for instance, it is possible to derive enjoyment. Reading a book twice, manifold, doesn't require multiplying it. Same with playing a musical instrument or some games. Exploring the conditions under which intensive sufficiency can happen, what I call the general economy of sobriety, is fundamental since the intensive sufficiency is the condition of possibility of extensive sobriety, which is now knitted and which is now factored by many countries around the world. Also, that's important because the poor are much more advanced uh, in this respect. Equity and questions about the distribution of the efforts to be made are also paramount with regards to this general economy of sobriety so that, again, uh, no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander. This is a very interesting uh, end to the day. I think it provokes us in interesting ways. I um, have been sitting here co-googling uh, zombie technologies to get under your skin a bit. And I look very much forward to learning how your thinking continues. So please, uh, I know now we're collaborating with uh, CETAS and you, so I look very much forward to tracking you in the, in the next couple of years. And um, yes, beyond that, I want to say thank you so much for everyone who stuck through. It's a really wonderful day. And, um, and yes, uh, it's just been uh, really great to be together. Thank you, Martha, for leading our Discussions has been really a great joy. And um, thank you to all the PhD students who have uh, supported us in introducing everyone and making everyone feel welcome in really extraordinary ways. So I look forward to next time and um, speak to you soon. To those of you who are not part of our little community here or in the bigger community, Please do remember that we're going to have this call for papers for UIA. Well, Congress will be sending it out. You're really welcome to uh, jot your emails in the chat box and we will pick up and put you on our list if you're interested. I'll keep the session open for a little bit. But I think it's late in our world, Jessica. It must be past lunchtime in Mexico. And uh, Yes, thank you so much again, and bye-bye, everyone.